So, hi there, everyone. Can everybody see me? Because suddenly you all disappeared. There you are. You are back. I, we, we don't see your video, but we see your, like, you know. You see my picture. Yeah. Now we see you. And do you see the agenda? Yes. Great. So hello, hello, and welcome everybody to our 10th annual Oakland Breastfeeding Festival online. There's a long story about how we got here, which I'm, you know, I might tell you some other time. Keep watching me on Instagram. I'll tell you. Oh, I love how the little hearts fly up, Marley. That's so cool. Anyway, 10 years, 10 years. We started uh, 10 years ago meeting with families over at Lake Merritt. And um, it was growing and growing and growing. And then COVID happened. And then we've been online ever since. Um, I'm really proud of us of being able to still have wonderful events, even though we're not all in the room together. I had hoped that we could be in the same spot together this year, but there's always next year. And if I'm not here, what do y'all make sure it happens, please? Thank you. Because, you know, things happen in God's world. Um, big dreams uh, are coming true for me today because uh, it has been my desire since I became a Bay Area birth worker for us to be all more united in the work we do and in the in the people that we love in our communities, uh, just like our our ancestor granny midwives, uh, every neighborhood people need specific care in that neighborhood. So it's not just it's not like you can't do it, but it is better that people are connected with people who are in the hood with them, in their hood who they might run into at the supermarket and who care about them in a very specific way and can watch their kids grow up after they help them bring their kids into the world and help them with several kids if if they so choose to do that. And so I want to say uh, the big, big welcome to Marley I Mystic, uh, who is, yay, who is from Sister Web, uh, who is a, a wonderful sibling dual organization across the Bay in San Francisco, so far away. Because you know how it is. Folks in Oakland don't go to San Francisco, right? In San Francisco, people are like, ah, Oakland's nice, but whatever. Yeah, that bridge is a deterrent. For oh sure. my gosh, it really is. It's just so much work. So I would love you to introduce yourself and say hello to, to the people. Yes, thank you so much for having us here. Um, it is truly an honor to take part in this and to be a contributor to this festival. Um, I have known Mama Samsar since I became a birth worker over 10 years ago. And mm -hmm. to be able to work in community right now across the bridge and through the waves of this video, I'm just very excited to be here, especially representing Sister Web SF Community Doula Network. We also have one of our doulas here on the line. I see you, Fati, Fatima, if you could wave. We provide uh, free Black doulas for Black uh, birthing people here in San Francisco, and we just celebrated our five-year anniversary. It has been a wonderful work for us to not only provide doulas, but to make the job of doula full-time benefited employees and um, something that you can count on a paycheck every two weeks. And that was very important to us, especially being in San Francisco and you know how these prices oh, are in the Lord. Bay. And we want people to be able to do this work and remain in the city, remain in the Bay Area. And so that's a, a big part of it is our economic um, justice for our birth workers. You know, we shouldn't have to piecemeal together because we are doing sacred work. And to be yeah. here for a breastfeeding festival, I have a special place and I'll share my story later, but um, it's very dear to my heart. Lactation, getting human milk into human babies is very important. And so um, when it came time to partner on this, it was a no brainer. Sign us up. What do you need? We're here and we'll show up and we'll make sure the people know about it. So thank you so much. And thank you all who are taking your Sunday afternoon. We know you're getting ready for 
to school week and grocery shopping. You know, we know how we do. So just thank you so much for being present um, in this time. Thank you so much, hon. I appreciate that. I want to uh, mention another sibling doula organization, which is Cornerstone Doula Trainings, um, who've also been very, very helpful to me. They don't have a representative person with us, but they send us all our love and they've helped us to market. And so there's another, there's a nice triangle of yeah. of doula workers. And I just, I just love, you know, we all serve different populations and their needs. And uh, it's, it's heartwarming to think that people can and will get their needs met with us working hard. And to hear you, Marley, refer to being a doula as sacred work, because that's really important. That guides everything that you do and all the, the policies and procedures. Um, and we are at this time where people are trying to fit uh, taking care of your family, paying your bills and having a retirement uh, possibly um, and not selling out to, to, you know, corporate shenanigans or, or capitalist shenanigans, which don't have human needs at the, at the forefront. So we're in the middle of that struggle. I'm happy to be in that struggle with you. So we have, introduced ourselves that's fabulous and i would like to uh, have the i am some sorry morgan i didn't introduce myself i am <laughs> go to, i am the uh, uh founder and executive director of the oakland better birth foundation in oakland california and my director mika Cade, is going to talk to you about a, a very important project that, that we'd like you to know about and to support Hello, everyone. Um, as Samsara said, I'm a director of the Oakland Better Birth Foundation, and it was really my work as a doula and under the mentorship of Mommy C. Samsara that I realized, actually, our, I received a calling to become a midwife. And so I am currently in the process of going to midwifery school to become a licensed midwife in California. And it's very exciting. And, you know, soon after I made that decision, I realized there's very little funding <laughs> for students. And it, uh, because of the way that some of the school, most of the midwifery schools are set up, we're also not qualified for like federal grants. So scholarships, um, for, um, you know, even student loans, if you want to go into debt for this, <laughs> um, you, we can't even access those kind of things. And so at the same time, uh, a community midwife who attended the birth of my first son, um, reached out to me and said, Hey, I see you're going to midwifery school. I'm trying to raise money for student midwives. And I was like, Oh yes, we need this. So we started an organization called the BIPOC student midwives fund, which I'll put in the, um, in the chat here. And we're also on Instagram at BIPOC student midwives. And, um, we would love for you to follow us what we, so we started just wanting to raise money for student midwives and quickly realized that we needed to do a lot more. And so we host monthly skill shares taught by local midwives for student midwives. Um, and those have been very popular um, through the largest gathering of student midwives in the Bay Area at this time, and it's free for students. And we also just um, just closed the application process for our first round of funds for students. So we have um, 10 Bay Area students that will be providing $1,000 scholarships to start in this pilot year. We're hoping we can give more, lots more. And we have other funding opportunities coming up, but our funds have been all from um, community fundraising, from, from our community, from our home birth families, from friends and family and all of that. And um, and it's beautiful. It's so wonderful that folks have shown up that way. And we need folks to continue showing up so that we can continue to foster and grow and provide the money so that our BIPOC student midwives can do 
the work that they need to do. So if you want to donate, you can. If, you, if you're a student midwife and want to come to our skills day, we have one coming up ne- uh, this the second Tuesday of September. Um, and you can touch base with me or just go through the website and get that info. Thank you, Samsara. You're so welcome. Yeah. And so next we will have Dula Maria. Hello, everyone. Hey, I... wait, give me a sec. Give me a Ooh. second. So she's ready to go. First, <laughs> we, we want to do the screen share. And and I want to let folks know that um, I'm all about nutrition and this having babies, trying to make babies, trying to feed babies situation. Um, so a uh, standing part of our festival is to have a brief moment to talk about the nutrition and its importance. And so... Uh, Dula Maria is going to do that. Um, this is her first public presentation. So you guys will all give her your kind attention, I'm so sure. And then we will uh, we'll take it from there. Do you know how to, are you, do you need help with this screen sharing, hon? Well, I think you have to stop sharing and then it will. Uh, okay, Bob. I okay. stopped. Look at all these beautiful faces. Hi, Jessalyn. Hi, Kathleen. Hi, Keila. Oh, my goodness. So, everybody. Okay. Okay. You guys can see, right? Mm-hmm. Slideshow mode. Okay. And it still looks good? Yeah, it looks great. Okay. <laughs> um, as I said, I am Dula Maria. I've been... Uh, in doula work coming up on a year now, so still pretty fresh. Um, but today I'm gonna talk about five finger eating. Um, I really love this method because I feel like it's super straightforward and um, simple, but so like straight to the point. So what is it? Let me move myself out of the way. Okay, so five finger eating was developed by Midwife Valerie El Halta. It's an easy way to make sure you get the nutrition you need during pregnancy. Pregnant women need to eat all five fingers at each meal at least three times a day. Using this as a foundation, have fun and creating uh, and eating meals and snacks. So the first um, category is protein and it's vital in order to literally build the baby, everything, placenta, umbilical cord, all of that good stuff. And pregnant moms need 100 grams of protein every day. So as it says, meat, fish, eggs, beans, all that stuff. Um, I think uh, hard boiled eggs are like a great snack because it's like just a little punch of protein and you just throw it down. Um, yeah, and also some types of soy. So green leafy vegetables, um, and there are actually some on here that I had never even heard of broccoli rob, um, and like Swiss chard. So there's a lot of options here for green leafy vegetables. They're a good source of <clears throat> calcium, magnesium, iron, potassium, zinc, all the good vitamins, fiber, folic acid, all that stuff. Um, personally, I really like to throw a bunch of greens in a salad with like one of those, um, I think it's called safe catch tuna packets, which it may be the only, don't quote me on this, um, approved tuna packets for pregnant women, but I know like every packet or every batch is mercury tested. So it's been a- approved. Um, and that's like, I eat that several times a week. Um, and here are some lovely pictures of some greens. Next is whole grains. Uh, So whole grains are like little energy capsules because we absorb them slowly, they keep us going. So some 
Good examples would be brown rice, quinoa, millet, bulgar, barley, oats, buckwheat, um, wheat berries, wild rice, all that good stuff. So already with those things, like you already got a full plate. And number four, vitamin C. This is going to boost and strengthen the immune system. Um, this helps you with avoiding getting sick and shortens your recovery times if you do get sick. Um, and let's see, good examples are berries, grapes, cherries, kiwi, so a bunch of fruits, papayas, bell peppers, tomato, carrots, cucumbers, beets, cauliflower. Um, let me know if I'm like running to this through it too quick, if anybody wants to take notes on like examples. <laughs> and then number five is water. Extremely important. Pregnant women need to drink about 10 cups of water every day. And this is gonna help regulate body temperature, lubricate and cushion joints, protect the spinal cord and other sensitive tissues. And of course, all the amniotic fluid that's there, all of that is water. So very important. And as it says it on the slide, to make sure you're getting enough water, check your pee, it should be the color of light lemon juice. Again, 10 cups of water every day. And thumbs up for fat. There are very good healthy fats, nuts, nut butters, um, good healthy oils, seeds, avocados. Um, and yeah, like it says on here, yolks, chicken skin and yolks. Those are all good things. So this is also an energy source for everyone and especially pregnant moms, which is going to help with managing moods, brain function, energy, and all of that good stuff. So I believe, yep, that's the last slide. And that is it. Thank you so much, Dula Maria. Does anyone have any questions about anything that she just shared? She's there and I will help her. So, excellent. Thank you. First time, give a round of applause. <laughs> Thanks to do you. like when my sons were Boy Scouts, we were like, this is a round of applause. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. Let's see what's going on in here. What's going to be next? Uh, I like the little electronic hand clap. Da, da, da. Uh, Luann, are you here? Yes, I am here. Where are you, Peanut? There you are. Hello. Hi, how are you? I am well, thank you. Nice to see you in person. Yes, nice to see you as well. Only uh, seen your picture and heard your voice. It's nice to see you in person. So um, you're here to talk to us about a rather serious matter, yes? Yes, um, we're going to be, um, Belinda's on here as well, um, but we're going to be Hi. talking about some um, predatory marketing, marketing um, and especially how um, Bobby Formula is the catalyst for this new wave of um, formula marketing um, in the Black maternal space. So take it away. Do you need screen sharing? Um, yes. Okay, let me try. Okay, are you all able to see my screen? Yes. Okay. Um, so I will go ahead and get started. Um, so I'm Luan. I am from um, one of the leaders of the Radical Moms Union and um, the head of this new grassroots um, division called the Radical Black Moms Initiative. 
Um, <clears throat> and so some of the things that we believe is we believe attachment over independence, um, biological norms over cultural um, norms, and then an intact mother baby dyad. Um, and again, we're a grassroots organization of black mothers and black birth workers um, who are fighting to keep corporate influence out of black maternal spaces. Um, so just a little bit of my story um, for my firstborn child, who's now three. Um, I'm a mom of two, a three-year-old son and a nine-month-old baby girl. Um, and I had a planned home birth with my um, first son and it ended up in a hospital transfer and ultimately a C-section. Um, and my son was born. He was already 40 weeks. Um, when he was born, he was five pounds and some change, um, which was different than any ultrasound said, but regardless mm -hmm. the hospital system, you know, they couldn't believe that he was low, like so low birth weight for full term. Um, and so they pr came in and poked and prodded on him forever. And like just every hour on the hour, almost just checking his blood sugar, just in case. Um, and we were having a little bit of, um, of an issue with his latch, um, even though I was asking to see the hospital lactation consultant, um, who kind of dismissed it and was just like, you know, squeeze your boob and shove it in his mouth. And it was just a hot mess, but either way, <laughs> um, in my birth plan and I, you know, I kept advocating saying like, I really just want to exclusively breastfeed, like anything to help, anything to help. Um, and so on the third day that we were there, um, even though my son's blood sugars never got low, um, they essentially threatened to send me home empty handed and bring him back to the NICU if I didn't supplement him with formula anyway. Um, so that was my like very kind of traumatic experience into motherhood. First, the C-section from the home birth. Then I'm like bawling, not wanting to give him formula, being coerced, wanting to sign out AMA and just being terrified that CPS would come get him if I didn't essentially comply at the hospital. Um, and so one thing that we always make clear before we kind of dive into the presentation, um, cause I know formula, a lot of the times is a tricky subject is that we don't criticize women. Um, we don't criticize moms who choose to, or have to formula feed. It's all about the system that's in place that profits off of the selling, and uh, uh, formula and women not meeting their breastfeeding goals. Um, so the reason that we are highlighting Bobby formula is because they're kind of like this new wave of like luxury formula, um, for them, it's all about kind of like how they appear, how they look. Um, and they're a catalyst in this new wave of influencer, mar influencer marketing and marketing online, right? They're like the new Nestle, if you will. Right. Um, yeah. and they're doing it by, <laughs> they're doing it by essentially trying to ally themselves, look cool, look popular, um, you know, partner with influencers and things like that. And so we have noticed that um, not only are they sadly very good at it, but you have a lot of new, like smaller formula companies that are coming, like By Heart, Ketamil, um, that are realizing that this is working and they're starting to do the same thing. Um, so they're kind of the driving force in this new way of what I would say, like modern day marketing. Um, and so as we know, in the U.S., black mothers are nine times more likely to be offered formula by healthcare providers than white mothers. Um, and I had heard that before I had my son, um, even from a dear family friend of mine who even when she had her second baby and she had exclusively breastfed her first the hospital was still like, oh, that's, we know, but just in case, like you have to have this formula. And so she had told me that she had already had, had her second when I was pregnant with my first. Um, and so it was just interesting to kind of see how that played out in my own birth experience at the hospital, right? Like I, I had to give my baby formula or else I was leaving the hospital essentially without him. Um, and so um, this is just some of Bobby's predatory marketing, if you haven't seen it. Um, for World Breastfeeding Week three years ago, 2021, this is the ad that they launched on August 1st. So when everyone is out Ugh. celebrating World Breastfeeding Week, talking about why it's so important, here comes Bobby. How is breastfeeding going with the word breast crossed out? And what they did is they used, you know, a mother who had had um, a mastectomy preventatively because she had the Brocker gene. Um, this um, gentleman who was using a surrogate to have his baby a mother of four because she was busy. <laughs> um, and then an, another mother um, 
who is just an entrepreneur who didn't want to have to pump. So this was kind of like their, um, their um, spin on World Breastfeeding Week, if you will. So and they have so launched, cool. yeah, and they have since launched, they um, have a whole thing about being like feeding friendly now. So they're looking to essentially partner with, you know, doctors, nurses, lactation consultants even, and doulas that are willing to take like the feeding friendly pledge um, <laughs> that essentially says that they're, you know, they're feeding friendly. They're not going to push breasts as best, if you will. Um, so anyway, this is also some examples of like how they're using black influencers on Instagram to promote their product and talk about, you know, why they are using Bobby formula or why they're switching Bobby formula, because they know that influencers obviously have a ton of influence and, you know, black mothers are definitely more likely to take the advice and the word of influencers that look like them, especially. Right. Right. Um, and so this example just kind of goes to show you the power of influencer marketing. Um, so if you look on the right, you see that Bobby, you know, they posted this spend a day with us featuring Bobby formula ad and it got 123 likes. Okay. No big deal. But the actual influencer posted the same reel on her page and it got 20,719 likes. Okay. So the reach of people that are able to see this is much higher when they partner with these influencers and have these influencers post these ads on their pages. Um, and so another way that they're also trying to ally in the black space is they're trying to partner with all the black maternal um, organizations. So here they are partnering with For Cure For Moms, um, here they were uh, partnering with, um, I'm blanking on her name right now, but um, this lady was a, an Olympic runner and she had started a company that essentially set up places for women running races to be able to go and nurse their babies. Mm -hmm. um, and after she had been around for a couple of years, Bobby was like, hey, you know, we'll sponsor you, we'll give you funds. But, you know, now when these women stop to nurse, there can also be cans of our formula there just in case, right? <laughs> um They've uh, partnered with Elaine Weltworth. She has spoken at some of their events. They have partnered with Kindred LA and Kimberly Durden. Um, and most recently, they have partnered with The Birth Fund, um, which these things are all doing great work. And it's easy for them to partner to seem like an ally, right? Like we'll fund, we'll donate. Um, but really what they're doing is they're getting their name out in sacred Black maternal spaces, knowing that breastfeeding could save the lives of so many Black babies and Black mothers yearly. Um, so it's really just pretty insidious. And then we just have a quote from, um, Kimberly, um, who says, oh, did it stop sharing? I see it. Oh, okay. Um, she says choice should be based on equal options. Um, is having the op option of breastfeeding versus formula feeding really a choice when the options are not equal? There are so <clears throat> ingr incongruous that it has taken billions of dollars in research and insidious marketing tactics to build the notion that infant formula is just as good. When one option gives your baby preventative health benefits and the other increases your baby's risk for health problems, then there's not equal choice. The options are not equal. Um, and so um, I'm going to let Belinda kind of chime in and take, take it from here a little bit. Sounds good. If she's able to come off mute. Hi, can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. Hi, I'm Belinda. I am a uh, part of the Rad Moms Union and also part of the Radical Black Moms Initiative. Um, and so I want to talk about this quote from Kimberly um, and in relation to Bobby. And one thing we've noticed about Bobby is that they have a real knack for sort of poaching leaders in the Black maternal space. Um, so as Luann read, this was uh, Kimberly Seals Aller's quote about predatory formula marketing. Um, and then fast forward uh, a few years later, the Earth app launches their national doula ambassador program. And uh, this program is sponsored by Bobby. And this was really hard for me personally, because when my husband and I were trying to conceive, you know, I'd heard about all the stats about the Black 
uh, maternal mortality rate. And I felt like, you know, Kimberly Seals, Allers was really doing something very tangible to combat that. And it gave me a lot of comfort. Um, and it was really heartbreaking to like hear that this program was sponsored by Bobby. And of course, this is not a criticism of Kimberly uh, herself. We know that Black maternal initiatives are woefully underfunded. And what Bobby does is they swoop in with bags of cash and say, hey, we will fund this initiative. Like, we will give you the resources to accomplish your goals. And to me, this is more of a testament of how insidious they are, because as we know, they really only care about profit. Um, and they like to build themselves as the first mom-led formula company when in reality, they are a $142 million company that is funded by hedge fund and private equity money. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I know, right? So, <laughs> you know, when a Black mom decides that she's not going to breastfeed, these are the men that profit <laughs> off of it. Um, so <laughs> I know, I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's the truth. The truth hurts sometimes. I, I know, I'm sorry. I When I had this information, I was exactly the same, just like so distraught. Um, so if you can let me know in the chat why you think that these men are so interested in Black home birth and Black breastfeeding. Not even one with a suntan. I mean, come on. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> I mean, really. I know, I know. Um, Mika says it's all about the money. Yeah, absolutely. They just have like dollar signs in their eyes, basically. Um, when they think about, you know, black moms, you know, not not breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I know it's just horrible. Um and so um for those who don't know, which I'm sure, you know, most people here know. Um, in the 1970s, Nestle was in Nigeria, and they basically had some of their employees pretend to be nurses and go into um, this hospital or go into hospitals and convince, you know, vulnerable new moms that, you know, their breast milk was not going to be good enough and that they needed to formula feed. Um, they used black faces to appeal to black mothers in this instance. Um, and really Bobby is doing the same thing in the mm -hmm. black maternal space with black motherhood influencers. They're using black moms to appeal to other black moms um, in order to make a profit. Um, and it's it's really, it's despicable in my opinion. Um, so, yeah. yeah. So I'm kicking it back off to, to Luan to finish us off. Thank you. Yes. Um, and so um, this is just um, one last example of how they've interested, infiltrated the Black maternal space. Um, this is Latham Thomas. She's the founder of Mama Glow, who's like a huge Black doula organization um, out of New York. And so when they had their event um, two years ago, they had like a big doula expo. Bobby funded them. Bobby sponsored them. Bobby funded them. They had a whole like feeding booth that they had set up. Let me see if this video will play, but it kind of gives you um, just how pretty it looked. Um, it's an incredible community that Mama Glow has brought together. It truly takes a village and seeing that village. Show and they have their a nutritionist come and do a what talk. Feed our babies. The most vulnerable population, they deserve to have incredible food always. <laughs> want every family, whether you're exclusively breastfeeding, whether you're exclusively formula feeding or some combination of the two, we want you to feel confident in that choice. So anyway, that is kind of the, the, the type of thing that Bobby does. Um, and what's so interesting with that is with Mama Glow, Mama Glow being a black doula organization, the two nutritionists that they had sent were just, you know, two white women that really can't even speak for the community 
Um, but also it further kind of drives home that allyship um, because Bobby, when you look at a lot of their social media marketing, they talk about how breast is, you know, breast milk is better. Breast milk is best. There, nothing can compare to breast milk, but it's the act of breastfeeding, right? That um, is bad for your mental health, is incompatible with working, is going to lose you sleep. Um, so you should combo feed with, with their formula, right? And so this is a lot of what they're selling is this idea of like, breast milk is best, but breastfeeding is not. Here we, you can combo feed with our wonderful formula. And most moms can fall into that, not realizing that if you don't have the right system in place when you're supplementing, especially you're not pumping, you're not removing milk. If you're just willy nilly going to combo feed or supplement, that's the number one way you can lose your supply. Exactly. Um, because as we know, at the beginning, especially breastfeeding is supply and demand. Um, but one really sad outcome that came from them sponsoring this doula event two years ago was that um, these cans of formula ended up showing up at the local hospital um, in New York. And this hospital specifically, I believe it was Queens Hospital, they had just recently, they fought so hard to receive their baby friendly certification. Um, and when you achieve that with the hospital, you are not allowed to have, like the hospital is not allowed to supply samples of formula. Um, and so the head IBCLC, like in the months following this event was like, what is going on? These mothers are showing up with these cans of Bobby. <laughs> and so they, any, anyway, they ended up having to get management involved to figure out what happened. And it ended up being these black moms that were coming in that hired these black doulas that were at this event, giving these mothers the free samples of Bobby formula. Right. Um, so this is exactly what happens. It's not allyship when they're donating and sponsoring. It's all about getting their product into these hands so that once mothers and babies are hooked, they've got a customer at least for that first year of life, right? Um, so that just kind of shows you what the repercussions of that is. Um, and then here again is Latham Thomas. They are um, starting their own breastfeeding um, certification program for doulas. Um, so again, when you've partnered with a formula company, when you sit on Bobby's medical board, it kind of makes you question like, what's the authenticity of that? Um, that you're starting a breastfeeding certification, but you're also on the board with the formula company. A formula you know, company. It's a conflict of interest. Massively. <laughs> Massively. Um, yes. So um, anyway, um, that is kind of all we have. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. But um, if this resonated with you in any way, if you felt convicted in any way, um, and you would like to contribute your time, um, we would love to get our presentation um, into the hands of more birth workers. Um, if you know any moms or birth workers that we could talk to, that would be great. Um, if you'd like to take collective action and join our strategic team, that will be great. Um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen just because I don't know... Um, where the chat went, but I, I'm just going to put a link to a form in the chat. If you guys are interested, you could just put your information in and um, we'll get it and we can reach out um, and maybe figure out like how to best collaborate from here on. Um, and then if you guys had any questions, um, feel free to please either feel free to ask chat or come off mute okay. and let us know. Any questions or comments, folks? Let's do it. We got time. I have, I thank you so much for presenting this. Um, I have wow, started okay. to see Bob cans of Bobby formula showing up in my clients' homes and especially a lot of folks that are planning out of hospital births and. Wait, wait, it's showing up at the homes of people do birthing at home. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. this is toxic. Mm -hmm. And I think I, I have a feeling after watching your presentation and I can ask people and confirm that it's probably has a lot to do with the social media and influencer campaign because how, you know, how inundated are pregnant people with, with that information. Right. Um, and um, yeah, so um, I really, really appreciate that. And I'm just kind of a little in shock and disgusted by how <laughs> inundated like I kind of I get I, I definitely I remember seeing the Bobby logo show up 
like with the earth app and be like, wait, what? Like kind of confused about that, but I really appreciate how in depth that you went. And, um, I don't know what I have a question, but I just, I'm like really in shock right now. I'm sure I will at some point. Yeah. It's, um, it's a little bit disheartening. We've had, um, another mm -hmm. mother that's part of our group. Um, she's a lactation consultant and she was working with a client, a, a black mom who like came to their appointment with a can of Bobby. Um, and she was like, you know, why do you have that essentially? Cause there was nothing really wrong. <laughs> um, like breastfeeding had started off perfect. And this mother was like, well, you know, Bobby says they're good for working moms. Like that was the only reason. Right. And that's literally something that they have on their social media is that we're good for working moms. <laughs> So it's like, it's, it, what about it the really baby. Is, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's a mania that it's, it's, I think it's not just particularly American, but there's a way in which it is that whatever our, our, our influencers say, or, or if they, they say on TV, you know, somebody with a doctor's coat on went on TV telling people it was okay to smoke for how long? And people believed it. So, I mean, there's a lot of deprogram we have to do. Marley, you had your hand up. Yeah, um, it's interesting looking at Bobby. I hadn't, I've seen the name, but I never looked into it. So I didn't know what Bobby was. And to look at the way that they're marketing as this like healthy, clean option too. So you're you're going for this equal lateral, equal place with breast milk, but you're also saying, hey, if y'all could choose it, choose this. It's organic. It's, you know, grass fed. It has all of those key words in there um, in order to promote it. And so people who are trying to make that decision and they're like, well, that's the best one I can get too. There's something about the influencer has it. It's a luxury item. Like it's just, it's the best that I can get. So it's even um, creating that yearning that we get from social media for something better, right? It says, oh, am I making the best milk if I'm not eating the five finger right is my milk as good as bobby so putting that inferiority out there with the milk when i think it's probably the same old formula right <laughs> that they <laughs> yeah it's, 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 that much progress in formula over the ages besides adding more chemicals so if they just took some out it's still going back to the pet milk and the same type of you know indoctrination right. happening for our communities and using our people in that same way so thank you so much because I had no idea this was out there like that. That's not on my algorithm side of the internet. I had never seen it. I see all the, you know, breasts. <laughs> yeah, thank you um, for your response. And I think it's really interesting because as Luan pointed out, the way a mom says, oh, this is this is good for working moms. Like she wouldn't have said that about Infamil, right? Or about any other like regular formula brand, you know, it's like, so that really shows, um, thank you. Um, like how pervasive their marketing really, really is. Um, and then how, you know, they, they know what they're doing, basically. They really, truly know what they're doing. And, you know, a lot of what they sell is not just formula. They really, like, they'll sell sleep, you know, like they sell, quote unquote, mental health, like all of these right. things. Um, they, you know, they are not competing with other formula companies. They are directly competing with, breastfeeding um and as luan said they're like breast milk is it's the gold standard for nutrition right but the breast or standard. breast milk but breastfeeding is a nightmare you know it's bad for working moms you can't be a working mom and breastfeed it's bad for your mental health you'll get more sleep your baby will sleep more you know formula feeding parents sleep you know x more hours on average than breastfeeding parents like if you really do a deep dive on their page like this is all the type of stuff that you find and it's just it's disgusting it's appalling it's, beyond it's belief so jesslyn has um, her hand up sorry go ahead thank you i don't know if you saw me like just shaking we were just like sitting over here shaking our heads because it's so it's so infuriating and even though i knew the story about nestle i hadn't seen that i hadn't seen that sponsorship on the earth app that's really upsetting it's um, very upsetting it's very upsetting and I know there's also one coming out that's like the lab grown formula mm. they're like it's the same and 
I, I think the part that's like on my on my nerdy side, the part that's infuriating is just so dismissive of the science and the and the dyad that you mentioned in your first slide, the importance of the the parent infant diet and all the benefits of breastfeeding, chest feeding for everyone involved. Like it's just so it's just there's so much cognitive dissonance listening to it because I think what these people do and that maybe this maybe you see this too as like a negative aspect of social media is like they're sitting in on our inner circles so to speak of the issues that matter to people and they're taking that language and flipping it around and I don't know if anyone here has been in sales but I have and there's a phrase called pain points it's like well what's the customer's pain point and that's like how you try to find your in. And I feel like the, that board of white men that you showed, they were just like, what's a pain point we can continue to leverage? Um, but I was also just wondering for the initiative and your work with doulas, is part of that like training doulas up and teaching them how to talk to families and parents about this? Because obviously it is a really sensitive topic and we don't want to blame parents individually. Um, and so, yeah, I think like highlighting the systemic issues is really important, but I'm just wondering if part of it is also training doulas um, to speak yes. to this. Yeah, we would like to get there. Um, when I say grassroots, I mean, like, I think there's maybe like six of us right now. <laughs> so our, our, our time is very limited, unfortunately. <laughs> so like nothing's going fast, if you will. Um, but one thing that I feel like we've noticed is that in a lot of the doula world, there's almost this disconnection between like birth and breastfeeding. There's not, I yeah. think a lot of doula trainings lack like that continuum. Um, and so one thing that we would like to do is like get some more lactation consultants <clears throat> um, on our team and figure out how do we bridge that gap with doulas not only having at least enough basic, you know, lactation education to help their clients, um, but to be able to speak to their clients and not obviously you can't force a mom to want to breastfeed, right? Which is fine, but to be able to kind of bridge that gap in a way that allows moms to truly have all the information and know like when to seek out help, or when to seek out support so that mothers don't fall um, through the cracks. Um, one of the girls on our team, her name is Nyasha and she's been a, a doula for forever, but she says like, um, and I love this quote when, her and I were doing a one-on-one -on -one and we first started meeting um, a few weeks ago, but she said for her as a practicing doula, like her job is not done till that baby does their first latch, right? She's like, it's not the birth. She's like, until that first latch is completed, my job is not done. Um, and so I think it's that kind of mindset that we kind of need to get um, in the hands. Um, and that that is something that we, we do want to do is start kind of pairing up lactation consultants with doulas to kind of bridge that gap because I think there is there's kind of like a step off if you will um in the birth space I don't think the two are seen as a continuum at least from a lot of the talking that we've done um so yes that is something that mm -hmm. we definitely like to to get to the point where we can facilitate um yes I think another thing that's important to bring in is that there is this thing called the who code the World Health Organization code. World Health Organization, although I do have problems with them on a lot of other things, so firmly supports breastfeeding 100%. And if you are following the code, you should, as a hospital, should not be giving formula to the clients. <clears throat> Those little surprise packages that show up just as the parents get home with the baby or one week before they have the baby should not be happening. And unfortunately, this country didn't sign on to the WHO code. Wonder why? Because we don't have that good socialist medicine like everybody else got, right? And so there's money to be made. And so, but using that, this saying that this is a worldwide standard that this country does not participate in. We have the most birthing people dying in, in childbirth and the most babies dying before their first birthday. Put the put the pieces together, please, people. Yeah, it's um, it's 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 a strong concern, um, and I think it's also the mindset of like, it's the dyad, right? And I think a lot of people don't think about that as well, um, especially when you look at a lot of these 
organizations that are starting to help, you know, with <clears throat> health, um, and the maternal mortality. And like, that's great, you know, um, but that has to go through infancy as well. And I think kind of the babies, <laughs> the baby aspect of it kind of gets left off. Um, so it's like, how do we have these conversations that loop that back together um, so that we can, especially in the black community, like increase our breastfeeding rates and take that back. Cause to me, like one of the things for me is I felt like I was taking that back, you know, when I was pregnant and doing all my research, I was like, hell in high water, I'm breastfeeding. Like, <laughs> um, and it's something that it's, it's interesting because like when my grandmother <laughs> found out after I had my first, um, that I was choosing to breastfeed, like she would call me every week and almost essentially only want to talk about that. Um, <laughs> And my grandma's from the island. My family's from Haiti. Um, but she would call and she'd be like, oh, are you still breastfeeding? And like, she did it for so long. And then she would be like, so happy to hear that I was. And she would like, tell me about, you know, her breastfeeding all 9 million of my aunts and uncles and my mom. But like, I didn't think that something so simple would like mean so much to my grandmother. Um, so to me, it's like a taking it back um, in our community too. Absolutely. Absolutely. I see Brandy's hand is up. Yeah. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Sorry. I'm so disappointed. I miss this talk. I'm at work right now getting these babies breastfed. So um, <laughs> I miss it. I was like, I gotta go. Um, but um, one of the things I like to mention that I think that um, doulas have access to a lot of clients prenatally that lactation consultants don't have that access to. And one of the keys to make sure breastfeeding goes well is that prenatal education. Like they know what to expect. They um, you know, you know what's normal, right? Colostrum is normal. Milk should transition in a couple of days, you know, like those things are normal. And so if the parent, the families, the mamas are not getting this education prenatally, then, of course, things that are biologically normal get looked at like as an emergency, right? Or right. if, um, like, I just have a situation that I'm supporting this mom right now. Her baby is 9% down, born C-section. So we know, like, these babies that are born cesarean birth are going to lose a lot of weight faster, which will freak the mom out, which will freak the dad out, which will freak the doctor out, the PD right. out. Um, but just knowing like, okay, this baby will lose a little bit more weight. We don't need to supplement them with formula. We can, you know, initiate pumping and supplement with her own milk and like things of that nature. So that's one thing I would like to just add is thinking about how doulas can offer more prenatal education when they're doing their, um, you know, prenatal visits. And then the second thing I would like to add is um, about if, because I am a lactation consultant and sometimes formula is needed, um, it is a tool that we use, but thinking about how we can um, off, give it as a tool, but then if it's no longer needed after, you know, whatever, for whatever period of time, how to appropriately wean babies off of formula and um, make sure that breastfeeding is going well. Um, and I think that's one of the things that doulas have a lot more access to patients, you know, as far as weights, as far as get, getting that knowledge, as far as making an appropriate referral to a lactation consultant. Um, and I know like a lot of doulas that reach out to me, it's always after it's a train wreck. I'm like, girl, how am I going to fix this? Like, <laughs> like mama's milk supply low, baby not latching, mama haven't been puppy. I'm like, girl, like this is too much. Like, and it's only so much we could fix, right? Before whatever. So just thinking about those two things when um, you know, addressing, you know, this formula supplementation issue is prenatal education and then like making those early referrals so that we can help get breastfeeding back on track. Absolutely. Very, very good point. Very, very good point. I mean, you know, it's not about bashing formula. Um, it is about, formula has its place. I've heard somebody speak of it like you should have to get a prescription for formula. That makes sense. Because there's something going on, there's something incorrect, and you're, you're prescribing something to help. And if at all, and sometimes 
people can't breastfeed, but you know what? If the mom had three shots of fentanyl and an epidural and the baby was dragged out with forceps, maybe that little cutie is not feeling like breastfeeding right now. Or a baby has a bad latch because it's, it's whole face has been misaligned. Why don't we send that baby to get some cranial sacral therapy? There's work that needs to be done. And in the meantime, the baby might need a little formula so it doesn't lose too much weight. Bearing in mind that a baby's weight after it's born, if it's born in the hospital and the mom's been on the IV, that's not even the baby's weight. Right? So there's just so much shenanigans, so much smoke and mirrors around something that should be the most organic thing in the world, as should birth be the most organic thing in the world. So yeah, I think doulas, we are, we are as usual, the frontline soldiers there. And we can really help, you know, getting folks to getting getting folks to people like Brandy, who I know is an excellent lactation consultant. Uh, my other favorite lactation consultant is Tanifer, two righteous black women helping folks of all all stripes nurse their babies. Beautiful, capable providers, you know, I totally trust. And we know who they are. If, if someone's watching who's not in the in the East Bay, I feel sad for you because we got the best of everything. But um, they're they're wonderful people in all communities, and it's a doula's job to know who they are and make sure that folks can speak to them. Yeah, it definitely needs to be mentioned more in doula trainings. Uh, doula trainings don't talk about it enough. I will put out a shout out for SMC trainings because I have lactation consultants actually come and teach during those trainings. And that I think that's wonderful and more should be, I mean, we have to take a look at doula trainings. There are, there are doula trainings that are really focused on making money too. So we have folks that take these trainings and they're out in the world and they have no idea. Okay, well now what do I do? Because they have not been prepared for the real world of being a doula. You know, these folks are just spat out there. And so, and that, that increases the burnout, which is pretty high for doulas. Gee, I wonder why with these kind and gentle hospital experiences we get to see all the time, right? So uh, we, we're all doing our work on that. I really thank you both so much for sharing this information. I think you put a fire under us and I'm, I'm grateful because when I spoke to you, I was, I had to stop clinching my jaw. It took me a week. Just that I was like, it's so disappointing. And, um, and, and the connections being made with people that I have a lot of respect for, it, it's heartbreaking. Yeah. Um, um, thank you for allowing us to share. Um, and, you know, I think our mission after we've kind of seen how some of these leaders that we look up to have kind of been compromised in a way, um, is, you know, that's why we kind of put this together was we were like, okay, what other leaders need to hear? Like, who can we get to before Bobby does? Right. And that's essentially part of our mission. Like what other organizations, black maternal organizations, who are their leaders and how do we get to them and make sure that they don't fall prey to the generous hand <laughs> of, 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 um, just another formula company who's opening the doors for, you know, by heart and Kenna Mill and, you know, little Oak and all these to follow suit um, because their yeah. social media pages are, they're doing the same things. <laughs> well, I, I want to put a challenge out to everybody who's on in this particular meeting today. So everybody get on our social media and start talking about what you learned today because social media travels far and wide. And so if a bunch of people start talking and tagging about the subject, so at least when they tag Bobby and they get the pro Bobby, they can get the other problematic start too. It has to start somewhere. And let's see, well, let me take a look at the chat and then we're gonna move on though. We could talk about this for the rest of the night. Do you mind if I share some things? I just might have. Let my me just read. see. I just opened up the chat, so let me address this really quick. So, Mika, what did you want to say here? And then we'll we'll get to you, Shireen. I'm sorry, I saw your hand up. too. you have the little electronic hand up? Oh, I'm just wondering if you had social media handles you could put in the chat. Yeah, that's a good idea. 
do you have social media handles that can be used in that effort? Yes, um, I will put it in the chat. Um, and then um, I can also reach out um, to anybody that filled out that form and send them via email, but I, I will go ahead and put it in the chat. That would be great. That, that's a start. And Shireen, what did you want to say? Did I say your name uh, correctly? Yeah, that's right, Shireen or Shireen. Um, thank you so much for sharing that information. It's like learning about lactation stuff. I feel like we focus a lot on Nestle because they were the big players in the past. I mean, and still are. Um, but like really appreciate you sharing that about Bobby. Um, it's kind of crazy the parallels too, because like they're using hierarchies kind of like they did with Nestle like using the nurses that dressed in with these nursing gowns we're like here this is what's good for you and now we have all these wellness people on social media are like here this is what's good for you and like using different people to target different populations and um, yeah it just feels like we have a lot of work to do um, but really appreciate you guys working in the radical moms union I think that's really important um, and just like having more conversations. And I think, yeah, the doula trainings is, a, I think needs to be addressed more. Um, and maybe there's some way that we individually or collectively can put more pressure um, to make sure that this stuff is being brought up and how to like talk to clients beforehand and help them um, understand marketing stuff too. Um, and to understand too, like, your bodies make the perfect food. Like your bodies are interacting with the baby's saliva to be like interacting with your mammary glands and your lymph tissue to make the perfect milk, whether they're sick, whether they're at a certain growing stage, like that's yeah. not something that you can make in a product and sell it. And exactly. even with, yeah. And even with like the new, like I know, I think at UC Davis, they're working on lab grown or like, yeah, lab grown milk. And it's like, you actually can't, because milk is a biodynamic product and you can't just like bottle it and put it on a shelf. It's well, awesome. They do it with everything yeah. else. I know it's so frustrating. But that's the thing. Anyways, I, I, have I to get, or get, you know, everything in the supermarket pretty much is fake food. It is except for the stuff around the edges. And even that, unless it says organic, it's fake food. So what the, what do they care? Yeah. I mean, they, they're not looking at the development, what happens with the baby's brain and the parent's brain and body, all of the benefits from how much reduced cancer, mm -hmm. if you are lactating, breastfeeding, chest feeding parent so much to, to ensure your life, to make sure you get to be a grandparent. Mm -hmm. Where Where is their stuff in the jar going to provide that? Yeah. Oh, I get so mad. And but we also digest and better when we have oxytocin in our systems, when we're connecting. We do everything better when we have oxytocin in our <laughs> system. Everything. That I, I, I was saying to someone the other day that if, if a hormone was God, it would be oxytocin. What, what does it not help? Not the fake Pitocin that they give people in the hospital. Fatima has her hand up. And we, we do need to change subjects. So Fatima is going to be our last chiming in on this subject because th we could just have a conference just on this. Go ahead, my dear. Yeah, thank you so much. I said my name before. I'm not hearing you, darling. I'm sorry. Oh. Oh, be uh... Raise your volume. And you have a soft oh, voice. Uh, can you hear me now? It's much better. Okay. Much better. Um, yeah, I, I was just saying uh, thank you so much for saying my name uh, the way my mom calls me, <laughs> Fatima. Uh, so I really I appreciate it. that. If um, I had a daughter, I just wanted to add on Fatima. to the conversation. Ditto to, you know, everything ev everyone said. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've been a doula for about like five years now, and I've been working for Sister Web for two years. Um, and I'm a, you know, full spectrum doula. And uh, one thing I did want to mention is that, you know, we, doulas, we're not lactation consultants, nor are we therapists or the doctor, you know, but a lot of 
our clients rely on us like we are and right. rely on us to like handle or navigate those conversations. Um, and so a lot of my work within sister web is like, um, doing some, you know, care coordination around like reaching out, like if, as a doula, I'm unable to support them with that particular need um, or help, you know, I would be that person to help them like make those conversations so that they can get the help that they need. Because sometimes like, yes, information's great, but after the birth, my client has forgot everything we talked about prenatally. <laughs> and I'm still having to remind them, encourage them, guide them um, and make those connections even past, you know, the first latch. Like, I get that like the first latch, like if it happens, it's, you know, great, but like breastfeeding, it takes time, you know, like, like two, three weeks before a mom's really in the groove of it. And yeah. so um, my job, like helping her get connected with Brandy or Tanifer or like some lactation consultant, you know, around to be that like guide um, and expertise. Yeah, that's all I wanted to say. Not a problem. I say your name the way I do because if I had a daughter, she would have been named Fatima. So say hi to your mom for me. <laughs> I have all these boys. <laughs> anyway, I love my boys. So um, we're going to all take a nice deep breath together. I hope that this spurs us on in our activism as doulas, as parents, as grandparents, whoever is whoever's here, um, you know we we've been given papers and been um, been. I'm just noticing that there's what two cute babies in here. Yay! I love them. Um, <laughs> we have been given our walking papers to be talking in our communities. Um, we can connect with these lovely women and have them come talk to whatever groups we are part of, doula groups, parents groups. Uh, lactation lover, lactation lovers groups, La Leche League, all of those groups need to know that this is happening so that we can uh, support our 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 lactating parents. Super important. So, thank you. I hope you stay with us. But if you have to go, go with our love. So we're running late. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> <laughs> I knew it was gonna happen. Okay. So Mama says sorry. Is the recording gonna be sent out too? To the recording the is thank you for asking. The recording is going to be on our YouTube channel, which is Better Birth TV on YouTube. So if you missed this the this previous part, which I think was so important, but if you missed it, it'll be there. I am going to talk to these lovely folks about having them come talk to my doula group um, and talk to, to make sure. And so that'll be another way. I'm going to invite the birthing community to come to our doula group and hear about this. Um, and so there'll be other opportunities, but it will take after today's presentations, it'll take a couple of days before it's online, but it will be in our, our uh, YouTube channel and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We have a lot of really, really interesting things up there. So social media. So we're going to move into parents' lactation journeys. And Molly I is going to share and our other speaker can't be with us having a family emergency. So let's send love and light to to her and the I, I don't know what the emergency is but emergency is a word that I immediately go to prayer on that's what I do till I hear what otherwise and um oh, cute no babies need to eat we understand about that um is so is there someone else here who would like to share their lactation journey as well, since we have room for another parent to share? Okay, doke. So we're gonna go ahead with you, Marley, and actually I'll share my 
grandmother's lactation journey then, but I, I offered it to y'all first and you can still take it. Just raise your little electronic hand. So let me turn it over to you, Marley. Okay. Well, thank you for holding space for the stories to be shared. It's not one that I speak of a lot, but it is a big part of my life and my motherhood journey. Um, I think for me, it really starts off being breastfed. Um, the youngest child in my family, I was the only one who was breastfed. So there was always this talk about how, oh, yeah, you were able to be breastfed until you were one. And some of my earliest memories are like begging to still be breastfed. So I had this like really like strong attachment to my mother um, due to our time together during the nursing. And so when I came to have children, I knew I wanted to breastfeed. It was like, I want to continue on this tradition. And I even realized that um, because of some family members and neglect and things that I saw, I had even associated like the smell of formula, Similac, Infamil with like neglect and like something I didn't mm -hmm. want. So I had really strong feelings about it because of my environment. Mm -hmm. And um, when I had my first daughter in 2006, I had a um, Kaiser Hospital birth that I wanted to do everything natural right over there in Oakland. And um, it was very difficult for me with the OP baby trying to come in sunny side up. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. we went through several augmentations and ended up with the epidural and um, laying on my back with oxygen mask on and the threat of C-section. And I knew that's not something that I wanted to do. I knew that my body could just go a little bit further and deliver this baby. So with the help of a vacuum and um, a nurse who was a midwife telling me I could do it, I was able to have a vaginal birth and I was so excited and put that baby right on my breast. And she latched on and I was like, this is it. This is going to be an incredible journey. And then the next day, the baby wanted to sleep all day and the nurses were getting nervous and, oh, that you're not having enough milk and she's not latching and all of these fearful things started to come in. And, and so they came in with the formula and was like, this baby needs to eat. You know, it's not happening with you. You can go ahead and try this. And from the moment they popped it open and I smelled it, I was like, no, this is not what I want to do. Please give me a little more time. And I remember begging, like, just give me a little more time. But before I left, some of the stories that we've heard very similar, it was like, you need to take this formula with you here. You can tape it to your breast and still get stimulation, but you need to feed the baby because what you have is not sufficient. So I went home that way. And when I went home, I was mad. So I just threw all the formula away because I was like, I don't care what they say. <laughs> I'm not doing it. Like, I, I just praying, you know, that she'll live and my milk will come in. And the next day, my milk came in and my baby was choking on the milk and I was able to latch with the help of my mom. And so with that baby, I was so excited. I was able to breastfeed her for two months. And um, she just was, it was just a victory for me. So I was very excited, like, this is great. I did it. Through all the trials and tribulations, I did it. So when I got pregnant with my um, second child, I was like, I breastfed for 22 months. Like, this is going to be easy. I'm ready for this baby, you know. And I'm not having a hospital birth. And I'm going to have a black midwife. And I'm going to have a doula. And it's going to be at a birth center. And everything's going to be wonderful. And eight months into it, I got a small pain in my left breast. I was like, huh, I don't know what's going on. Keep an eye on it. Maybe it's a cyst. Maybe it's something. I don't know what it is. So two days later, it grows to the size of an egg. And I have to go to the my OB. She does an ultrasound on it. She's like, well, it's not a cyst. It doesn't have fluid. Just looks like inflammation. You know, um, let's send you over to this other place to go get an ultrasound of it and do other things and poke and pry. And so they scheduled me for um, to come back in over the weekend. Maybe it's just inflammation. Take some erythromycin and send you home. Over the weekend, the other breast starts growing bigger and worse than that side. So I call back like, hey, this appointment I have on Monday. I'm going to need y'all to book it for both breasts to see what's going on. 
and I'm eight months pregnant with a baby who's about to turn three. And this is very scary. And so um, they send me over to the surgeon who does the ultrasound and the mass on my left breast covers three quarters of my breast. It's just hard and nobody knows what's going on. So I'm like, is this mastitis? Do I need cabbage leaves? Do I need warmth? Like, what is it? And they're like, well, maybe it's an infection. Just keep this erythromycin and we'll see what's going on. So I stay on this for a long time and they say, let's do a fine needle aspiration because we want to see what this tissue is since it isn't any liquid in there. There's no, no biological entities. There's no virus. This is very strange. We want to take some samples. So they go in with the needle and take out samples from both of my breasts and call back the next day and say, oh, we did it wrong. We need you to come back in do it again hmm. so I'm like okay <laughs> I want to know what's going on before this baby comes because I want to be able to feed her so let's go go back they do it and nothing identifiable maybe it's an abscess so now they want to do a draining of the abscess so a counter hole and stuff it and pack it and stuff it and pack it so this is over the holiday season. It's now moved into right before Christmas. And they say, you're going to have to pack this wound for three weeks. So that was the most painful thing I had ever experienced in my life. I had no idea what that meant, like packing and unpacking a wound. And at this point, I am hugely pregnant. Like the baby's due January 22nd or something. And it's December 20th. So I'm oh I'm I'm ready to be done being pregnant at this point. And I want to know if I'm gonna have to feed my baby formula because my breasts are these huge mass underneath the skin. And so um I put on the bandage to go and do it and put on some neosporin and the skin it peels off with it. So now I have an open wound and I am just like, I am not going to be able to feed my baby. This is crazy. And you can imagine that the doctor is pushing medicines and other things to deal with the symptoms. And I was like, I can deal with the symptoms. I want to know what the source is. I'm not, I don't want to dull the symptoms, especially being pregnant by putting medicine in me. Like I'll be in pain, I'll do whatever, but let's get to the source of what this is so that I can be fine. Um, this continues on and there's a whole bunch of tests and a whole bunch of things and they find a whole bunch of inflammation in my body that then begins to affect me in other ways from arthritis in my joints to vision issues because my eyes were inflamed. And so um, that's when I'm like, okay, I will take something to get rid of the inflammation because I want to be able to walk. But can you give me two weeks to see if the baby comes first? Because I don't want to put nothing in the baby. And so by the time the baby comes on January 28th, that morning, like some of the symptoms release a little bit. I get a little less pain. My arthritis isn't as bad. And I'm able to give birth to her at my doula's house. And one breast is extremely open and one has one little open space, open wound. And uh, my midwife says, you can latch her on that breast. And that's not something that my OB was telling me because I was doing dual care. And she says, you can latch her on that breast. Let's see if the milk comes out. And so I didn't know what it was. I didn't know if it was going to hurt. I didn't know anything and all this trauma had happened. But I did know that I wanted to be my baby and that I specifically said no to all of those medicines so that I could try. And so she latched on and um, I was able to feed her on that one breast. On the other breast, the nipple had been compromised. It had been opened up into a wound as well. And so I was then able to put her on there. And so in dealing with my doula, who's helping me out and coming to doctor's appointments with me, she's like, you know, people have twins and they feed their babies. So while you're worried about if your one breast will feed this baby, I can guarantee you that your body has the capacity to feed that baby from one breast. And I remember the relief that I felt in like realizing that it was possible 
because all the information that I was getting was looking downhill. Like, I don't know if this is going to be able to work. I don't know if this is going to happen. You know, are my breasts even going to work? Am I going to have to get a mastectomy? Like all of these things were coming up for me. And nobody offered me formula in this situation in the midwifery care with the doula, right? Where I'm having a ton more issues with my breasts then the little bit, I only have colostrum going. That was happening when I was in the hospital with my first birth. But the midwife and the doula was saying, hey, you can do this. Try it out. Sounds like she's swallowing to me. I'll come check on you tomorrow. And I remember posting a picture of my baby and the midwife calling, hey, she's looking a little small in that picture. What's going on? Has she been eating? You know? And I said, oh, yeah, I think it was just the angle. She had just woke up. She said, okay, send me another picture of the baby. She's looking good. How is your breast doing? You know, and I learned even more in this process. I had heard about all the wonderful things that breast milk did for your body and how it's antiseptic. But on uh, while I was feeding my baby on my left breast, my right breast was still an open wound that they had no idea what was going on for a whole another maybe uh, eight to 10 months. And the amazing thing about it is that breast milk would flow out of the wound right? And it kept me from getting any infection while I had my wound open for almost a year. The breast milk just continually cleansed it. And I was just like, this is madness. Like, how does this happen? They want to do all of this and apply all of that. And Spirit said, no, your body has already been created to take care of itself. So I was able to nurse my baby and I nursed her for about 16 months and she was ready to follow her sister so I couldn't tie her down when she got some real food in her and she was ready to lean um and uh when she finally did I was able to like really you know do everything I needed to do to close the wound I did end up needing some assistance from some medications but the tenacity that I had to put forward in order to do that through all of it I think was the number one lesson for me coming in like oh I'm gonna be able to do this and then all of the like is it gonna happen I know if I had a different support team, my story would have looked completely different. And because I had that support team, um, I was able to reach my breastfeeding goals with both of my children and to just be able to share that story to say, I breastfed you from one breast girl and look at you, taller than me now, right? <laughs> and to have this victory story um, because of my support team. So that's my lactation journey. Amazing blessings on you. Um, it, does anyone have questions or comments for this righteous parent? My goodness. So I really appreciate you sharing such a heartfelt journey. And I'm just so grateful you had all the support around you because that could have easily just been, this is too much. I'm going to give the baby formula. So easily. Definitely. And I appreciate the East Bay community because um, at that point I wasn't as tapped in. I hadn't done my doula training yet. I wasn't in with the um, birth worker community. And so I did turn to La Leche League and mm -hmm. The support there was so helpful. And especially when as I was navigating, like they want to try all these medicines. Every one, they had the medical book and would pull it out and say, this is how it's going to affect the baby. This is how it passes on. And I was really able to make some informed decisions, much more informed than the information I was just getting of like, you need to try this medicine. Oh, you're breastfeeding. You can just stop, right? Um, so yeah, that support is really powerful. It's really everything. You know, it's a, it's a, your story is a, a beautiful uh, story of your resilience as a parent, as well as, you know, the, the village coming out. And you could, that, that is the way things have always been done for human beings. It's not a new concept, mm -hmm. right? The proverb was stolen from African tradition and, and said some other person said it, which they never did. But that's okay. We know who said it. Um, and okay. so it does, it takes the folks with the wisdom 
to be able to be calm and reassuring because the poor parents slipping out as every right that, that they have every right to do that but who's going to come in there and say no there's another way to handle this you know and yes these there are medications but then looking at the side effects and is is that what you you know is that what you want your baby to potentially experience and, and going through it and having all the having everything line up it's beautiful you know I'm glad that you got to tell this story. I'm sad that more people haven't heard it. I feel honored, you know, but I, I do think we need to talk about that. But we need to be in circles talking about this stuff a lot more, especially talking with people who haven't had their kids yet and people who, uh, uh, who could make decisions before there's a kid to worry about making decisions around. <laughs> can help you choose the right partner. It can help you do a bunch of things. Start thinking about that ahead of time, right? It's like, what? You've been wanting to have a baby your whole life. And then all of a sudden the person's like, whoa, not me. <laughs> like, oh, seriously. Yeah. So talking about these things beforehand is super important. I will, I will, uh, I will share a story unless someone else has changed their mind and really wants to share theirs, which I'm open and would be a, the door is open. You got one more minute, not a minute, second. Okay. So I'm going to tell my story and it's, uh, it is not easy for me to tell because I'm a grandmother and a mother-in-law. And so one of the things, I mean, I've, I've, I have a big commitment in my heart around being a good and helpful mother-in-law because there's so much in the in the, in the culture and there's so much in that I've seen about moms and grandmothers being like the least helpful person when their daughters and daughters-in-laws are having babies and it's like I just don't want to do that. Um my I have a brand new grandson. He's not brand new anymore. He's getting old. He was born in January. So he's just, he just started crawling last week. Oh my God, the cuteness. Anyway, so, um, and I'm also thinking about what I want to say because my son and his wife are very private people. I initially actually invited my daughter-in-law to come and speak and she was going to, and then she had a family emergency and so she couldn't speak. So I'm going to talk about it from my view, being the grandmother in the story. So um, my beautiful grandson had to be delivered by cesarean section. There was a bunch of medical reasons. Um, I see. Uh, Brandy, are you going to be, after I do this, are you going to be back in time? Let's hope. Yeah, I should be. Um, hopefully by 5 o'clock. I just got to go help the baby last real quick. All right. See you soon. So that was already ironic and, and upsetting for me as a grandma, as a grandmother who's a doula, who talks about natural birth all the time. Um, and, but there were some solid medical reasons why this had to be that way. And I took a deep breath and prayed for the best for my daughter-in-law and for the baby and for my beautiful son, who's my baby son, who is having, who's the daddy here. So, you know, black women in their baby sons. Mm -mm -mm. <laughs> There's a lot of going on there. So um, they did really well. They, I, I have a lot of respect for my daughter-in-law. I think she's an amazing young woman. Um, I watched them do everything they can to have as holistic a medical experience as possible. And um, Along those lines, I mean, I offered to have them have a wonderful doula. And I can just say that my sister Mika there was their doula. And that way I could just be in the grandma space because I'm a fount of, I could be verbally diarrheaing all this information that I want to make sure that they are getting the information that they needed and not what I wanted to tell them. Those two different things. So they... Their little one was born by cesarean section and 
uh, mom has other health issues and she started out having the baby to the breast and was very happy about that. I could see uh, what I what I saw was that although she had to have a medical delivery, she was very much at peace to be able to provide the this nurturing to her baby from her body. And things became difficult. We were looking at what was going on and her were issues with milk supply. Uh, she talked to several lactation people uh, and she found an MD lactation specialist. And I do need to get this doctor's name and definitely uh, call them out in a very positive way. So this was a doctor who was a lactation consultant who knew like everything about the boobies, everything about the breasts and was super helpful of an understanding of her desire to want to nurse the baby. Uh, they did checking her hormone levels and they found that there was, there were problems and it was not going to happen enough to sustain him. And so what she said to my daughter-in-law was, well, you know, just look at it like you have skipped some steps because what tends to happen is once the baby gets older, breast milk is like an appetizer or dessert, right? So right now you're in a place where you can give, even though your baby's very young, the amount of, of your own personal breast milk you can give them is either appetizer or dessert. And we have to look at well, how are we going to provide the baby's main meal so he can grow and be a big chunky monkey boy, which is what we want. And that made her laugh. And when she shared it with me, it made me laugh. And I was like, that's a very sweet way of explaining that to somebody. So right now she can do snack and appetizer, but where is she going to get the main meal? And they asked for my help, which I was so happy. I was like, oh my God, I guess I'll be the help now because I've been chomping at the bit. And so I got on, on the internet and put the word out that I have a grandchild and my grandchild needs breast milk. And folks came out of the woodwork. Like people were wonderful. Women were so generous, giving hefty bags full of breast milk <laughs> to my daughter-in-law, people dropping off breast milk and then my son going to pick up breast milk. How many little baggies of breast milk, you know, uh, it was this really touching. It was really moving. It restored my scent, my 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 love for humanity to see how people were just. They had more milk that they can even use. This kid's gonna have breast milk till he goes to college, <laughs> and he's this gorgeous, chunky kid. He is he is one hundred percent breast milk fed, and um. And so many beautiful people are responsible for that. And I, one other thing I love about my daughter-in-law, this is just this like a mother-in-law loving her daughter-in-law speech here, but it's true. And she talks to, so she talks to our little guy and she tells him, you know, there's so many people that we have to thank. We have to thank all these nice ladies who gave you breast milk so you can be healthy. And she tells him, the donor breast milk people's names. And we want to be grateful and we want to love them because they're good people and they help you be big and strong. And I was just, you know, I have holding back my tears when I heard her say that. This is so, so beautiful. That's so, so beautiful. And it was really important for me um, as the grandma, even though it is not my show, and I've got the recording playing in my head. It's not your show. Uh, but it is with regard to being a grandma. And um, I was really happy to be able to help them. <clears throat> and really happy to have been able to be part of such a rich and beautiful community here in the Bay Area that people did not hesitate. And when I look at, when I look at this little guy crawling around and having his best life, um, I too want to give thanks to all the people who uh, who helped his parents to nurture him. So I will thank you this, thank you all this way.
So do folks want to have anything to say? Does somebody have a quick story that they want to share too? I see the nice little hearts. Those are good. I like them. So what we're going to do is take a break. We're going to take about a 15 minute break. And then when we come back, uh, Brandy will be talking to us. And then we will have our feature speaker, who is Hansi Gore. And uh, I think, wait a minute, let's make sure, make sure I'm getting the, I think we're closing out with Hansi. Da, da, da. Yeah, five o'clock is Hansi, and then we will talk to you our wonderful lactation specialist. So enjoy your break and I will see you in about 15 minutes. the research in order to give uh, pregnant women and birthing people and birth professionals access to the ability to either make informed decisions um, about their care um, or to help others make informed decisions about their care. And, and then my sort of brand is not to just give people information, but also what can they do with it once they have it in terms of making a decision, but then giving them tips, ideas, um, where the uh, the sand traps might be mm -hmm. uh, of, of, of implementing the choices of carrying out their plan. Um, and that's kind of been my thing. When I'm at conferences, I often, I describe myself as the literature lady. I stroll through the gardens of research, collecting bouquets in order to present them to um, pregnant women and birthing people and birth professionals. It's like, I'm holding your coats for those of you who are actually in the trenches out there. That's exactly how I think of you and folks like you, because I my brain does not do research well at all, at all but I surround myself with people who are really good at it. And so that helps a lot. Um, and there, it's, an, it's, a, it's so important that two such people work together on a thing. Well, I started out, um, when I started out, okay, let me take one step back. It's like, why am I doing this at all? Yeah. It came from the difference between my first two births. And we can talk, I know that you wanted to talk about that, but for now, I just wanna say the second one, the first one was disempowering and the second one was empowering. And my next thought was, I want to help pregnant uh, women and birthing people know that the decisions that they make are important. It, it really affects how you feel about yourself, your baby, your family. So the first thing I did was to do things that got me into the trenches. Um, I got involved. There was a a, 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 a women's uh, a pregnant uh, resource center that was getting going in, in the community. And, and that same group was then also going to start a freestanding birth center. And I got involved with them. Um, and then the births that they were doing there. And I became a Lamaze teacher. And I was a... Well, I was a nursing mother's counselor first, and I got involved in attending versus a doula. But how I got to the writing part was that just what you said, it turned out it did not work well for me to be teaching Lamaze classes and attending births because what I discovered was I didn't have the right temperament to deal with the fact that what I was seeing mm -hmm. I knew that they should be treated better. I knew that what they were hearing from people who should 
be able to give them accurate information was not that. But I couldn't do anything about it. So uh, with reluctance, I I stopped attending births because it's really not, I mean, well, first of all, I was an okay doula, but I'm really too cerebral to be a really great doula. I think doula is hard work and, and I'm too analytic. Um, but beyond that, it's not good to be at a birth where you're not okay with go what's going on, <laughs> but the mother and the other people are. Um, oh man, that hurts. And then the way. same thing with my Lamaze classes. I felt like I was sitting in my classes and mind you, the cesarean rate was only 25% at the time. Now it's 33%. Right. And I felt like I was sitting in my classes saying, there's a train coming. Do you hear it? You see the bright light? You're standing on the track. Right. We're like, oh, well, my doctor says he only does cesareans when they're necessary. And it, again, I realized there was a, a mismatch between what my students were coming to me for and what I wanted to give them. And again, they're paying me for something <laughs> that's not. And mm -hmm. at the same time, though, I had moved into starting to do writing. And I realized that I had this other thing I could do that was less common that um, I could be good at, but that didn't put me in that position of, of, of watching things happen that I couldn't do anything about. Right. So that's how I got into writing. We sort of went all around the track. But oh, no, that's <laughs> exactly writing. it. You are on point. You totally are on point. Yeah, I mean, that's, I think that's one of the most challenging things about being a doula is that, well, especially a doula the way I am a doula, because there's lots of different ways that people do it, but, you know, like we give our clients all this information and we're preparing them for a spiritual journey and they're going into the heat of patriarchy. <laughs> and so how do you prepare them for that? You try. I also, um, I don't know if, um, well, actually, I sort of antedate the development of doulas. I mean, it was the 90s, and I got involved in the 80s. Mm -hmm. But when Dona did get started, when it leapt from being, you know, regional in Seattle to a national organization, mm -hmm. one of the problems I had with its philosophy was that we weren't supposed to sort of influence yeah that's, yeah and yeah. and on the one hand i get that it is her experience and it's absolutely vital that you make a separation between what that person is experiencing and and but the other but the problem i had with it was to stay silent is an agreement to what happened right. so i did develop some tricks and I, I imagine, you know, this was just totally in my own head. I imagine people have gotten a lot better than this of when I went to the, you know, the postpartum visit to discuss the birth to sort of open it up and say, well, how did things go? How did you feel what went, you know, that went well for you? Yeah. Were there any things that you feel like you wish they could have been done differently? Mm -hmm. So that kind of opened the door um, in a way to have a at least um, to see where the new mother was. And, but again, I felt like I can reach a whole lot more people with what I can do and not have so much of the pain of- Heartbreak, you know, yeah. Helpless. Yeah. I mean, well, I totally admire people who can, who can stay with it because they're so badly needed. It's like anybody who's working in a system that doesn't work. If everybody leaves, you know, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but, it, you know, it, I think it's very important, like with all the big issues that are facing this planet right now, that everybody do what they can. Yes. I mean, it's otherwise, what are we here here. for? Right. Right, 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 right. I mean, everybody, everybody has a role and everybody has a skill and a gift. And so everybody should do that. Um, 
giving up and doing nothing is is the is problematic you know mm -hmm. so i'm really grateful for what you do i have told you before i'll tell you again i think you do it super well thank you i try <laughs> you you succeed. and i've evolved over the years you know i've learned a thing or three since i first you know went out there to slay dragons i i realized that i didn't in in uh, my most recent book series, what I've come to, I'm I'm 76, so this is you know this is an evolution. Mm -hmm. Is that I didn't want to preach to the choir, which is essentially what I've done most of the time. I love preaching to the choir. Yeah, you get the love. Wanted to be in a position where I wasn't making assumptions about what people wanted. I don't know what's right for an individual person. So in the in the new series of books. I really wanted to create a no judgment zone where I could sort of metaphorically, you know, create a space around that person who's making those decisions and act as a resource without judgment. Because I think that's another thing that's just gotten worse and worse and worse is the there's only one right answer or only one right way to do things. Mm -hmm. Something, you know, whether it's within the patriarchy and the, and the medical management or whether it's in the, you know, we should just all go and have free births and, you know, not have anybody attend us. And, you know, it's just, I wanted to be in that space where I trust that you can figure out what's right for you. The problem is it's hard to get the information that you can trust. Yeah. And then what to do with it. You know, your, your most recent book, labor pain I was really excited I think you announced it on I saw it first on Facebook it was a post from you and I had little happy dancing emojis all over your announcement um because that that is like the number one thing that my clients are are struggling with right now um of over and over and over uh, to different uh to different amounts um some folks want and they want a, as natural a birth as possible, quote unquote. Um, and they, you know, and some folks are like they really want a natural birth, and everybody's afraid of the pain of having a baby. And so, and that gets played up so big, played up in our TV and movies, and women screaming our lungs out and all this stuff. And I, I didn't have that experience when I had my kids. I, I, I didn't feel pain when I had them. Uh, I felt a lot of other things. So that, that's been a challenge for me as a doula to put myself mm -hmm. in the shoes of folks who are experiencing pain and to find out, okay, what having an OP baby, yeah, that, ouch. <laughs> and so how can you prevent it, help it? What can you do about it? Um, and there are things that can be done. I've seen uh, my longest birth with a client was 72 and a half hours on an OP baby and vaginal birth, OP baby, vaginal birth. So um, it's like there used to be an understanding that women can do hard things, like we can do hard things, mm -hmm. but the hard, the culturally hard things now is like, well, in the business world, but not this biological in athletics. Thing. Athletics, which of what we just came off the you know beautiful examples of that at the Olympics, right? I mean, women just being remarkable, of course. Um, and but not in childbirth. In childbirth, you need several doses of opium, <laughs> and it's, so it's like helping people weed weed through that and to find that power with inside of them and to find that desire to do it because you don't have to and it's you know but that there's gifts in doing something that's uncomfortable in a culture that's so wrapped up in feeling good all the time is really challenging i tried to walk that line carefully though because and i think the beginning of my journey is of the you don't know at all was Penny Simpkin, hmm. may memory be a blessing, who said, you know, there are people out there who could only consider a VBAC if they know they're going to have an epidural. 
So that was kind of like that first opening of you don't or, you know, um, people who are coming in from sexual abuse situation. I mean, you don't know. And we cannot say for how do you find that space that opens up the this can be an amazing experience. This can be a life transforming event, which it was for me. That's between that first and second birth. Right. Without saying, oh, that's the right way to do things. And and you're weak or you're whatever if you don't yeah. take that. So th I, I think uh, it's so tricky. I think what you said is exactly the point, though. What you said was this can be an amazing experience. Are you willing to explore that rather than saying you're wrong if you don't choose that? I mean, you're not wrong if you don't choose that. But, you know, it can be. And for some, you know, uh, and it, it's everybody's right to choose that. But in the hospital setting, you're really not being given a choice. You're being prepped for surgery as soon as you walk in there. Yeah, that's the problem. And um, another one who's passed away, not very long ago, Judith mm -hmm. Lopez, who was a professor of nursing and very involved in Lamaze, made the point that, you know, you you can't say to women that, uh, you know, you, you, you should be able to do it without an epidural when the whole process is set up in a way that would prevent you from being able to do it with that. Exactly. You're in bed, you've got an IV, there are people coming in disturbing, you know, fill in the list. Yeah. So why are we surprised that a fair percentage of women who would prefer to have a, a, an unmedicated birth can't manage that because of how the system is set up? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that, and that's one of the things that I definitely say to clients when, for some reason, like their planned natural birth doesn't be, it doesn't end up that way. And one of the things that I can do helpfully as a doula is to point out how the system got in the way. Because the, the feeling that women walk away with this is me, my body doesn't work. Mm -hmm. And I will, I may, I do make it a point when a cesarean happens as a result of medical interference is to make sure I, my client hears from me before, as they wheel her away. Like, this is not about your body. We can talk about what, what was, what happened. And I love you and I'm sorry. I know, you know, she's crying while the nurses are saying, what's wrong with you? <laughs> like, would you stop? Isn't the, here's the other one that's like the, it's you know the, the stab isn't the most important thing a healthy baby it's like yes and there's lots of other things that are very important too exactly on the other hand nobody has and i put this is in the introduction to the book nobody i believe that nobody has the right to say for another person what their enough point is exactly and mm -hmm. I'll, you know, this is a breastfeeding on, on the whole. I'll say the same thing for breastfeeding. Mm -hmm. One of the things I learned as a nursing mother's counselor, which was one-on-one, -on -one, you know, work, you had somebody assigned to you, is again, you don't know what that person's life is like and what their experience is. And when I worked with some women where, as they would talk about what was going on in their lives, the best choice for them was to put that baby on formula mm -hmm. their lives just would not permit so there again is a situation where there's there is so much you know shaming and blaming and anger around around that where my wish is that it that the, that it be a conscious decision exactly don't make it in the middle of the night when you're dealing with a crying baby. But if this is not for you, then that's okay too. That is your decision and don't let anybody else tell you you've made the wrong one. Absolutely. You're the only one that knows. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. The folks are trying to do this, these beautiful natural things in such a our, our whole environment and society is, is not natural. <laughs> and so, you know, you do want to give support for people who want to. And, you know, for me, what I say to my clients is, let me be your epidural first. I'm your epidural. 
Let me do all my doula stuff. And mm. we'll see, you know, and if that, I love that phrase, let me be your epidural. Yeah, I'm I'm the one. I'm the walking, talking, breathing epidural. There's a lot of stuff that I can do. We talk about the gay gay theory and all those wonderful things and how your body will, you know, my massaging you can block any discomfort. We talk about and that's all science, which is really important to my clients nowadays. They're a very scientific group. And so, but there, but there's a lot that is totally scientific and like, let me do all these things. And before you know it, you know, what, and what happens often is like, oh, they're already 10 centimeters. It's like, yeah, you really want to do right now. Cause you need to push your kid out. So, you know, do you still want it? <laughs> you know, but that's, that's, um, but for the poor mom who's in the hospital bed all by herself without a doula and just their frightened partner there, you know, and when you say, when you say you're uncomfortable more than two times to the medical people, they're going to run and get you an epidural. But, you know, I, one of, I, again, I, when I get to in the, in the labor pain book, when I get to the split in the road, um, you know, the, the, your takeaway Plan A is you're planning on an epidural, planning to avoid an epidural. Plan B is you're planning on an epidural. But I say, even if you're not planning on an epidural, you need to know the things that will help you have one because you 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 only get to play the hand. <laughs> you don't know what you're going to get dealt. So you you need to know how to work with an epidural in ways that will minimize your chance of experiencing an adverse effect. On exactly. the other hand, even if you're planning on getting that epidural and you walk in the hospital, you need to know how to manage contractions without one because you can almost bet that there's going to be some point at which that will be helpful. It might be while you're in Home. It might be you get to the hospital and the anesthesiologist isn't available. It might be um, you have one and it doesn't take. Right. And and then the last thing is, and you might just find. <laughs> I also tell people, get in there, bring if you can hire, bring an a doula and all the reasons why that can be helpful either way. You might just find. That you can manage without one and then you avoid all the potential adverse effects so it's a win-win situation it's a win-win situation it truly truly is and you know it, it is really interesting there are certain doula training organizations that tell doulas to not be advocates and to not be educators and i'm just like what who do you work for people what is what is that I mean, we are, doulas have always existed before they were called doulas by Dona, okay? There's always been groups of mostly female people that went off with a birthing person to have a kid. That's as human as it gets. And so there was the midwife and there was all those other people who were helping and providing and rubbing the backs and the feet and the shoulders. And who were all those people? Those were all the doulas, all the community members who were supporting that at birth. It's not a new thing at all. It's doulas are as old as midwives as far as that's concerned. So, you know, don't feel bad that you need a doula. I'm bummed that it costs money and I'm bummed that, about all the, you know, the stuff of this world about it, but I got to eat. I got a house. I got, you know, whatever. Um, But we are replicating as much of that natural environment as we can in the culture in which we live. Mm -hmm. Does anybody else have uh, something that you'd like to add right now? I see things coming in in the chat. And frankly, I would rather hear voices. I'm old. So. I was butting into the chat. Um, Go for it. Yeah, I, I brought up. Well, you, you mentioned it too, Hensi, uh, about like epidurals don't always work, but also like providers using language where it's like, Oh, so when would you like your epidural? Or I had a client yeah. who was had a provider who was like really rough with internal exams. So they started asking for lidocaine and they're like, oh, we don't think you can handle this. Like, you know, and just being very like pushy about the language. And birth is such a vulnerable time too. And so 
when you're using language that's already like kind of pushing sorry my dog <laughs> when you're pushing the language um and kind of uh getting people to make decisions before they they came to that idea like if somebody on their own is like i really want to think about like other pain management options and then like then you help them with that but then when providers are asking it before people are ready i'm like i don't think i don't think that's right um yeah so that's all i had to share thank you it's one of one of the most important lines that i suggest that my clients have on their birth plan is do not offer me pain medication if i want it i will ask for it i would to soften that go for it i always think it's helpful if you're as non-controversial as you can be mm -hmm. is if you think of it from the nursing point of view from their perspective, the two things that they're there for is to help you have a healthy baby, number one, but number two is to relieve your pain. That's their training. So if you add to that, please do not offer me, I'll ask for it if I want it. But if there's anything that you can help me with to be comfortable that doesn't involve medication, I would really like to have that. So that opens the door to, there's something else you can do that kind of meets your, but if I'm not giving you an epidural to make you comfortable, you know, like you're sort of rejecting me and I don't know how to be helpful to you. So I have that piece. So, you know, here's the thing. Firstly, I love you for saying that. And I, I'm a battle wearied old doula. Imagine. You know what I mean? I'm doing just the, I'm just not the one. And so I'm like, the it's not the client's job to make the nurse feel comfortable, you know, but I get what you're saying, and what you're saying is helpful. It is, but it's like it's like having to negotiate with the tiger. It's like because you won't let me comfort you in the way that I feel you need to feel comforted then I'm going to have my nose out of joint, which does happen. I mean, you, which just does happen. And so, um, and the clients, at least my clients up to this point, they're not used to even saying what they would like to a medical person. The medical person is like God and can do whatever. And, and, for them to not be wishy-washy about their languages, because I've seen nurses use the wishy-washy language against them. I hear you. Mm -hmm. um, and what I hear you saying, because I'm going to respectfully disagree with it. Go for it. What you're saying it. is, if you're going to have agency, which is, by the way, one of the things that the research says does make for a positive experience, you need to be unequivocal about what you want. Mm -hmm. On the other side, there's a huge power imbalance between you and sure. the hospital staff. Sure. And in both situations, to the extent possible that you can create an environment where you make them your ally, mm -hmm. you are better off than if you set up a confrontation where you are perceived as being a difficult patient. Well, just my client's blackness is, they're already difficult. Exactly. Well, and you know, that's interesting. You just pointed out something to me that I didn't consider, which is to what extent, And I don't know the answer to this, but you could, you're speaking from a different culture. It's fine. I certainly, I mean, just be, being a woman, I have some experience of that, as, you know, assumptions made. Mm -hmm. But if there's a way to be in a, I mean, sometimes you can't prevent saying no, and you have the right to say no. But if there's a way to get what you want by speaking the language of the oppressor or giving them a face-saving route where they can feel like you're not um, opposed to them in a way that sets their back up or that, um, or that confirms their expectations of you, 
and you can still get what you want, I think that might be the better path as long as it's not wishy-washy in the sense of where she comes in and says, you sure you don't want your epidural now? I know these contractions are getting harder. And and that anesthesiologist is going in to do a C-section very soon. We are the person can still say, please don't, you know, don't, please don't offer this to me. Um, so I think you can do both. I think you can be conciliating without giving up your power. I think that it's true. I mean, I do it all the time as a doula. Of course. I, I don't do, I don't, I'm not enamored of these people and I am not, and, and that's, that's, I, I respect good medicine being practiced on my clients. I respect care and compassion and empathy being given to my clients. And if that's not there, then it's on <laughs> because that's what I'm there for, for my clients to help support them from that. And the brutality uh, heaped on the bodies of Brown and black women, people would be, there, there should, you know, there should be, it should be the number one thing on the news on top of all the other horrible things on the news. The things that are said and how black and brown bodies are touched by by medical providers of all colors, not just people like, oh, we need more black doctors. Yeah, that's great. And we do need more black nurses. That's true. But if they all come through that same system, teaching them that women are broken and black women are even more broken. That's the attitude that's brought to the birth bed. And that's, that's horrible. I mean, that's, you know, and so you, yeah, you go in to have a baby and you come out of it vivisected. If, even if you don't have a cesarean, you come out of that really, really vivisected. And that is the, you know, that is, um, uh, Bottom line is, I try to get as many of my folks to have home births as humanly possible. Yes, <laughs> that's, that's really what it comes down to. I'm curious, this is a hot button topic and there's oh. no right answer. So I'm curious about if there are opinions out there from in the, among the rest of the people. You know, yeah, what, do you, what do you guys think? think? And I will say that while yes, it is definitely worse for people of color, White women who have high incomes and speak English fluently are not immune. It's not just at all. Not at actually, all. Actually, it's a little more it's more subtle in the sense that they, I think yeah. they're more primed to not realize that it's happening to them, but that's another story. Anyway, it's, it's hear, more of it's, it's more better. of a mind F. It is. It's more of it, yeah. it it's because they think they're being well taken care of. Yeah. Yeah. It's really nasty. Because I mean, you know. Yes, I totally. At least agree. you, people of color, know to be wary. <laughs> and I think there's in this situation that we're talking about, um, in terms of being assertive and very direct in what you want for your care, is very important when you're a person of color, a black woman specifically, because there is always that negotiation or that backup with evidence based birth information that oh we have this so this is the right choice so there's a lead a leading that is happening let me lead you down this path that I know because I have you know the some study that had 40 people in it and and now I know this information and this is the better way for you um that comes up often and so it has to be a firm word of like this is what it is we know as women that our no is open to negotiation where a man's no is an answer right it's a complete sentence and so you put black behind that and it's like you didn't even say anything let alone negotiate with me and so I think in my um history of supporting specifically black-bodied individuals in those hospital moments, there's a lot of things that come up where you can be, like you were saying, I'm sorry, in terms of, oh, this doctor knows everything. Let me just go ahead and do it because I don't want to be looked at as a hard to deal with person. Mm -hmm. I don't want them to you know, look at me this way or not believe me when I do say something, if I say what I'm really feeling here. So there's so many levels that, especially mm -hmm. when I'm working with clients, it's like, be direct, 
be secure, understand what you're saying, know what you're coming from and stand on that because it will be a conversation to lead you or a repetitive thing. Are you sure? Uh, yeah, they don't, they don't stop. Stop. Looking like at this point, is that still your decision? Let me say when my decision has changed, even if you're not offering, it's like, oh, look, at, are you still okay? I'm still fine until I tell you I'm not fine. You know, like having to put on that armor. And so I think from my experience and I've supported people who were, you know, the other demographic, well-to-do white women who came in there and their nose, especially I work with people who are nurses who go into the hospital. It's like, oh, I'm a nurse. I know they... They answer, they, they're fine. They can play the game like, okay, I know the nurse has to do the job. So let me say it in this way and engage with them. And they're still respected when they come back and say no. And so it's a lot about the way that that person in that room is viewing you. And we can't say it as a blanket statement, but in general, if you're coming into that space, black body and having an opinion, like you have to stand on it because your word almost like Jim Crow. Let me get somebody else in here to testify in order for you to believe me about what I'm saying is true. So that's, I mean, that's, that is a, another, thank you for that very much. Um, because that, that there, there are different realities. And so, um, and so it's really important for us to know that. I mean, I mean, for, for some of us in the United States of America, going in to have a baby is a fight to the death. We're fighting to avoid our death because we, there's a group of, just look at the, the, the numbers, the darker you are, the more likely you are to die, <laughs> really, right? But in the United States of America, this is the worst place to have a baby. Of all the industrialized countries, you're more likely to die or or be injured here. So um, I, I do think it's important to be tactful because there's also retaliatory behavior that can happen. That's that's actually what was at the forefront of my mind was the retali retaliation if you're seen to be difficult. Yeah. And, and the big fix is, you know, why, you know, why all this fucking patriarchy when people are having a baby? Why all this? I, I it is like if what what's bring what it's bringing up for me is say I was an abused. I mean I I I not say I was an abused child. So we all knew that when my father came home, we had to tiptoe. We had to tiptoe because at any moment he could snatch one of us and punch us until he felt better and then let us crawl into bed. And so that brought up, that's what came up for me. <laughs> ah, sorry about that, but that's, you know, the deal. So I'm like, children shouldn't have to tiptoe around their father because he's going to do damage to them. Women shouldn't have to tiptoe around the doctors and nurses to make them feel better, to put them in the space where they'll give them loving and compassionate care because a nurse's oath is to provide comfort and care to the patient. Okay, and yes, you might think it's completely crazy that these women want to feel their labor, and that's the client's decision. What is why 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 is the decision to be uncomfortable that treacherous to folks? Are they feeling their own birth trauma? Are they having their own issues that they don't, this person is experiencing something that I chose not to experience. So I'm going to have nobody experience what I didn't choose to experience. These are big questions and I'm certainly not even ans expecting an answer to it, but I do think, you know, maybe a lot more nurses in therapy <laughs> working out their birth trauma so that we don't have to fight black women overall in the culture do an awful lot of fighting to stay alive. Fighting in, in corporate environments, fighting in, in you know, sometimes in domestic violence in, uh, issues, uh, working with other kinds of doctors. I just had a meeting with my rheumatologist uh, where, and I felt completely disrespected and unheard, and I'm not going to see another doctor because that guy was really 
very, you know, had big diplomas on his wall. They all do. And, you know, the listening skills of Annette. Yeah, I think listening skills, there's so much packed into actually listening to what the other person is saying and moving from there. But you know, I feel like what I loved about your the Labor Pain book, which I love about all of your, I love all of your books, but I, I know halfway through the Labor Pain book, I'm listening to it on audiobook. So when I take my shower, I'm listening to you in the brain. <laughs> <laughs> and I really feel your effort to be, to not have a side. And I do think people need to have that. I do think that people need to be able to take in material and it's clear, it is clear that you are a fan of natural birth, but you also have this balance that doesn't allow people, it makes it hard for people to just dismiss what you say. Oh, she's biased and walk away. It's, I, and I feel the effort that you put into that in how you write. And 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 I lo also love that your your daughter is the speaker in the audio book, which I just think that is so beautifully profound. That I'm listening to your your child's voice talk talk about this matter. It's it just makes it very personal for me. It, it's a hard situation, and um, we're not going to solve any of it all tonight. And I think there, yeah. I think all the sides that we've talked about are valid and important. Um, and I think that your book adds a lot of important information to the struggle. Thank you. Does anyone else have to say, my beautiful people? There were some interesting things coming up in the comments. Let me see that. Yes, epidurals do not always work. Do, do, do. Not just listening to respond, but active listening. Every you know, yeah, that should be. I don't think that's taught. In that, that is I'm way sure me down the list. I mean, and the other thing is, even among the medical professions, mm -hmm. obstetrician, gynecologist are surgeons. Yes, there's a personality that is people who choose surgery. So that's yes. sort of a whole whammy, even among medical professionals. It's really true. But anyway, uh, active listening, but not just listening and waiting for your turn to talk, but really taking, going, going where that person is. That is such an important skill. And and Fatima says there is also a huge lack of accountability from providers that do cause harm to anyone at the hospital. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It's a it's a safe environment for them. That's why home birth midwives, I mean, they're they're out there alone. <laughs> they're out in the woods by themselves. Um, but it, it whatever happens, most things, unless it's so egregious that they can't cover it up. Um, um, yeah, you're you're protected in that environment. One of the, I'm gonna I'm gonna scroll through. There's a question here. How do you see? Uh, Jessalyn, could you just uh, read out or say your question? Oh, she says the mic is broken. So it's how do you oh, see oh, 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 your and your career and longer term impacts on lactation and mental health, where we see maternal care's ongoing impact and increase in in increasing numbers. Was that being addressed to me or to both of us or? You take it. <laughs> okay. What do you think? Well, what do you think? Mm -hmm. The depressing thing is that I started to get involved with the first, let me get rid of this because it's distracting me. Let's see. Yeah. I started to get involved with all of this at the point where the cesarean rate was going up. When I had uh, my first child in 74, the cesarean rate was around 5%. Mm -hmm. um, by 1980, it was 
at um, 15 percent. In fact, there was a there was this meeting for a consensus conference about how to reduce the cesarean rate, which had reached the outrageous heights of 15 percent. Mm -hmm. um, so I was in on that first wave. Three things were happening together, which were actually interconnected. One was the rise of um, continuous fetal monitoring, continuous electronic fetal monitoring, the use of epidurals, and the cesarean rate. And in all, and when I got involved, it was, you know, and also when I got involved, and this is why I got involved in reading the research, you basically had the opinion of doctors versus what the research was saying. As things progressed over the life of my career, um, frankly, the only thing that changed that was a step in the right direction was there's fewer episiotomies. So in some ways, this has been an ongoing effort um, that has felt futile in many ways, like I can't make a difference. The other thing that's happened even in my own field is, as I said, when I got started, it was about, well, this is the opinion, but here, let me tell you what the research actually says. But as the years have gone by, the research, because it's done by people in the system, and they don't pay attention to the midwifery research, it's an echo chamber. And what answers you get in the research depend on what questions you ask, how you interpret the data, and a whole bunch of things that you end up with these studies, like 39-week induction is the one we're living with now, at which now they have the research. So again, you're not even in the position of saying, it becomes, you know, well, they have a study, they have lots of studies, what have you got and what do you know, as opposed to, you know, they're saying this, but let me tell you what the research actually says. So it's it's gotten infinitely more difficult Definitely. Um, in that way. And every time there's a step forward, there's two steps back. I actually, in like around 2000, ACOG was publishing documents about the cesarean rate was high. And that first conference in, in, um, in uh, what was it in? 19, 1980, um, actually came out with, well, we should be doing feedbacks and we should, and, and you know, maybe it'll make a difference, didn't. And then in 2000, again, it was like, there were, we're doing too many cesareans. Here's what you can do to reduce. You, did it catch hold? No. There are, there are even more recent, you know, how to reduce coming out of ACOG. Right. And I thought again, not considering it to be active labor until you get around five or six centimeters and other things like that. There are, again, documents coming out of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, and then came, and then came the ARRIVE trial. And I was as like physically ill over the ARRIVE trial as I was when Trump was elected in 2016. I mean, because I knew what would happen next. Yep. So if you wanna ask about the trajectory over my life, the only thing, the two things that, there are a couple of things that give me some hope. One is the people who are advocating, um, I now have much more sophisticated techniques, the people who are involved in trying to improve birth, because now, Back when I was getting started in this, there that was at the cusp of the time when um, there wasn't a large number of women who stayed home after they, you know, had their babies or, or didn't maybe go back to work until the babies were much older. But now you have the young childbearing women and birthing people who are also involved in being lawyers and marketing people and you know a, a lots lots of things that give them that give them more skills and they know the second thing is the internet which does allow you to reach a lot of people very inexpensively right. so that that that's kind of been a change and there has been a rise again in in the young people because there was a while there 
when they were being nicer when they did cesareans, mm -hmm. <laughs> so, <laughs> where there didn't seem to be much activism around them. So it's nice to see, and, and you know, us gray-haired ones were like, <laughs> you know, like we got a hand on the torch. So I'll say two things. One is, I think it is so, so difficult and that things really have not gotten better, except for this one issue of episiotomies. Mm -hmm. In some ways they've, they've gotten a whole lot worse. Yes. But for those of us who are working out there, I will say to you, what I said to you earlier, is in the thing that keeps me going, um, I'm Jewish and it comes out of the Talmud. Um, and one of the books of the Talmud is called the wisdom of our, our forebearers. And there are just these little short things that really sort of unpack into a profound spiritual and ethical guide. And this one is, you are not obliged to complete the work, neither may you cease from doing it. And that has been like, yeah, I can't fix it, but that doesn't excuse me from doing my bit. Um, so a long answer to that question. So I'm hoping that for those of you, uh, I think even among people of color, I think there were very few black midwives, very few black duos. That's a, that again has been on the rise. I'm not sure when it started, but it's- um, It's a good thing. It, it, it's a good thing. And I will also say that some of the major organizations that were that were involved in in midwifery, especially out of hospital midwifery, and 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 the big do, you know the doula organizations who were criticized for being basically you know white and middle class have heard that criticism and things have changed. I'm sure they're not as far as you would like to see them, but I think that's been a huge shift in that that um, recognition or Lamaze for that matter. There's been a you know another big organization that was white and middle class of of, of um, understanding these issues and do and 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 becoming allies and doing their best um to to um to open the doors and 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 bring people into leadership positions and just be much more um so the criticism has been heard and that i think has been something important as well and this is a good spot for us to stop and I want to really thank you for your time and your words and your books. So let me tell you where to find me. Mm -hmm. I'm on Instagram and I'm on Facebook on um, under Take Charge of Your Birth. If you look for me under Hensi Goer, you, well, Instagram, you'll find me, but that's just I have to have that one. So it's Take Charge of Your Birth. You mm -hmm. can also find me at hensigoer.com. You can find out more about the book. You can also um, sign up for my newsletter. We post about where to, where to do that, and it's also on the website. And so you'll get two newsletters a month. One will be my uh, my monthly new blog post, and the other will be sort of um, right into your mailbox, so you don't have to bother with what Facebook decide or Instagram decides to show you mm -hmm. uh, on um, sort of roundup of news items so that's me yay thank you so much and have a wonderful rest of your evening you too and um thank you for having me on this has been wonderful and um i learned a thing or three <laughs> isn't that nice it is <laughs> <laughs> you be you stay blessed my friend thank you bye-bye bye-bye So beautiful people, we have seven minutes and our beautiful lactation counselor has to leave us at six, but I would like her to have some time. You can have full time and folks who have to leave can leave. And this is being recorded. So people will, but I don't know if folks heard that over a hundred people was like 150, 160 people saw last year's breastfeeding uh, festival on our YouTube channel. So whatever you say, we'll we'll go out there and and be sowing seeds. But Ms. Brandy, thank you for your patience.
All right. Hi, everyone. <laughs> I'm super excited to be here on the 10th annual um, breastfeeding festival. Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know if you got my message, but I just was checking my emails because, you know, I don't work after Wednesday. And they approved us to have the courtyard today. <laughs> ah, I know. I was like, yeah, oh, oh my God. Yeah, they, uh, oh, my they God. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, thank you for telling me that because that is the comic relief that I needed. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. Oh, that's funny. It was, I was like, interesting. But um, <laughs> next year, we can get on top of it sooner. So it takes about a month to get it all approved. <laughs> we'll know that for next year. We'll try, we'll do it next year, a month ahead of time. Okay. Okay. We got, the, we got it down now. Yep. Um, so for y'all don't, who don't know me, uh, my name's Brandy. I'm a lactation consultant. Been doing this work for almost 20 years, 19, 18 years. Um, I started off as a breastfeeding counselor at WIC. Um, I literally just fell into lactation um, by being a mama. Um, I had my daughter at 21 and she breastfed well and as a 21 year old, um, I didn't know that there was like a black breastfeeding crisis. <laughs> um, I grew up in a family that breastfed, so it wasn't not normal for me to, you know, breastfeed. Um, but when I started working at WIC, I was like in culture shock because I found out that black women had the lowest breastfeeding rates. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, as I was getting my degree, I shifted all of my work, my research, my papers, everything I could do about lactation. Um, and yeah, I became an IBCLC in 2010 or 2011. I can't remember. One of those years. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I've been moving and doing things ever since. Um, I work at Highland Hospital that's the job that pays my bills. So if any of you all ever have a mama who delivers here, please ask for me. I'm, I work mostly Sunday through Wednesday. Mm -hmm. um, but we have, we're a very unique hospital because we are baby friendly and we have lactation support seven days a week, 9 a.m. to 1 a.m. So we are really trying to be like that breastfeeding friendly hospital to get those mamas support that they need while they're in our care it's fabulous yeah but I wanted to share with y'all can I share my screen really quick let me give you permission okay I wanted to share with y'all my heart um which is about my uh nonprofit organization that I started a couple of years ago it's called breast friends lactation support certain um services and um we provide lactation support throughout the Bay Area for any mama, to be honest, but our focus is Black mamas who are lactating uh, to make sure we can increase the breastfeeding rates of Black mamas in our community. Um, okay, let me just, I'm going to do my little quick presentation for y'all so y'all can hear all about breast friends. All right. Okay, so here we are. Um, That's so cute. <laughs> oh, look at you. Myself, my family, uh, my girls. I have three girls and a little boy named SJ. He just stopped breastfeeding when he turned four. So I am, that was uh. July. So I am weaning. I'm like sad about it because he's my last baby. So it's my last time nursing. Um, but it was a great experience with him. He was a home birth baby. Um, born at nine pounds, two ounces. So I'll be telling people like, girl, you could push out that nine pound baby. <laughs> it's not impossible. Um, but a little bit about Breast Friends. We started in 2013 just as a support group in West Oakland, really focusing on, you know, what were the issues? Like why wasn't um, Black Mamas breastfeeding more than a month? That was like, we could get them to start, but around a month, they would quit. Like, uh -uh, I can't do this no more. I want formula. I need help. So we started this support group to actually introduce the mamas um, to each other so they could have a sense of community. Um, and also just to 
actually answer their questions all at one time and so they could feel like you know they're not alone um and so we started this since this group called uh, breast friends and i turned it into a nonprofit in uh, 2020 i started the paperwork and then officially in 2023 we were a nonprofit so like i said our mission is to increase black uh, breastfeeding rates through individual consultation, group education, and lactation trainings. These are my board members and the members on our team who do lactation education and consultation. We're all women of color, and we do have some Spanish-speaking folks. So if there's a need for that, we um, are bilingual. So we have that um, service available. Um, the answer has always been in the community. When it comes down to breastfeeding, down to birth work, you know, the answers are right there. We know what we need. Um, and so the model that Breast Friends uses is workforce development and community driven. So all of our mamas that work for us or that have been a part, um, that lead our groups have been a part of Breast Friends. They have successfully breastfed their babies and now they're they're being trained as breastfeeding peer counselors and lactation educators um, to provide that support to the mamas in their community. So over our years, we have served over 931 families. Wow. Uh, yeah, and about 400 of them have breastfed over a year, which is very unique to um, support groups because our mamas actually have exceeded their goal. Sometimes they say um, one month, three months, and they end up breastfeeding because they see that it's normal. And it's their chance to see other mamas breastfeeding. And like, it's not a weird thing to see, you know, a baby one or two walking up to their mom. We also make community referrals to housing, to WIG, to doula support. Um, and so, yeah, we are doing the good work. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. Our model is to do group education. So uh, we invite our pregnant mamas to groups so that they can meet postpartum mamas and that their experiences, they can ask the questions. Not only they're not hearing it just from the lactation professional, but they're hearing it from, you know, members, other members of the group, their cousins, their friends who have been through very similar experiences. Um, and like I said, we have a peer-to-peer -peer model and breastfeeding is our norm. So we invite anybody to come who has a small baby, but they know like where, you know, they're going to be moms who are pumping breast milk, who are, you know, pulling out their breasts. And so we kind of let them know, like, if you're not comfortable with this, you know, get comfortable with it because this is how we do in group. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Yeah. Um, so some of the things that we do, our services that we offer, uh, we have mommy meetups, which is where we go to local parks in the community during the warmer months. So pretty much May through October. And we just expose them to being outside. Uh, we do in-home lactation support. Um, it's based on donations. Um, and so whatever that mama can afford to pay is really what we've taken. I mean, we've had people pay $25 people that don't have money and we've had people pay the going rate which is three hundred dollars so on a way for lack of funds and then we also have the mommy group that meets every month so we have two locations now one in west oakland and one at the bloom clinic um, at children's hospital we also offer skill building workshops so we have designed an eight-hour doula lactation training where you will get your hands-on skills. So you'll learn how to hand express, put together breast pumps, um, uh, work on latch and positioning, uh, learn how to use nipple shields or other lactation tools. So um, yeah, we've offered it a couple of times now. So I'll make sure the next time we do Mama Sim Sorry gets that information. Please. I'm gonna skip through these because um, that's just about Good our time. Story. Yeah. Yeah. Here's one of the cohorts of our doula training uh, <laughs> that you can see. Uh, this is what we did for Expecting Justice when they had their doulas. Um, and yeah, we trained, I don't even know how many of them, but they did their hands-on uh, skill building workshop with us. We also go over lots of case studies. So that way 
they feel comfortable like when things are thrown at them and they're like, okay, what should I do if the baby's 10% down and, you know, mama's milk hasn't came in yet. So we're trying to really build that breastfeeding muscle, that lactation muscle for doulas. Um, and, you know, it, it's just a great time. I, we've received really positive feedback about it because as y'all have heard today, uh, there's not a lot of uh, lactation training in the doula world. Yes. Um, and then right now what we're doing, we're at the Bloom Clinic, which I don't know if y'all have heard about this clinic, but it is ran by all Black pediatricians, Black nurses, Black social worker, and I'm there doing lactation support. It's at Children's Hospital um, Clinic, at, at the Claremont Clinic. And this is a really good way that if your clients want to have Black uh, center care they're able to get go to the bloom clinic i would really encourage it because like i said they if they really want to breastfeed and something is going on with lactation um i'm there to provide that support to get things back on track so if y'all know clients who are looking for black pediatricians send them to bloom absolutely that's yes. a great resource um, and then here's just what we do at Bloom. Um, the clinic is from zero to three year olds. This is one of the Bloom mamas there. So I'm br I bring everything. Uh, we help with twins. This is a mom who had a breast reduction and um, wanted to do some SNS feeding because she still wanted to have that breastfeeding experience. Uh, we serve moms that needed nipple shields. So like I said, it's a great place to get mamas that support that they need and get breastfeeding back on track. We do offer like lots of support and follow-ups via text and um, at their home. So definitely refer people to Bloom. <laughs> um, I always tell people that's a great way to get free lactation support. They're paying, the Bloom Clinic is paying us to go and support that family. That's fine. Yes. And then these are just some of the collaborations of organizations that we have worked with since becoming a nonprofit. So we've done work with the Milk Lab and the NICU Toolkit, a more excellent way that does community baby showers, Sumi's Touch, Black Women's Birthing Justice, Blood Birth Centering. So we're out here trying to build connections and trying to um, you know, filling that gap of care where lactation isn't supported. We're really trying to really trying to get that care um that continuum of care handled and get breastfeeding back on track for all of the mamas that we serve so i think that's it yep so if y'all want to connect with me please follow me on instagram at breastfriends underscore oakland or if you need a referral or a free consultation for one of your families that you're supporting you can schedule on the website at breastfriendslactation.org so thank y'all Thank you so much, Brandy, and all the great work that you do. Madly appreciate it. You're welcome. Does anybody have any questions? Jesslyn, is your hand up? Do your clapping. <laughs> it's hard to know. You see the little electronic hands. What are they doing? I don't no, know. No, right. Okay. So any questions or comments? <clears throat> I have. Well... Brandy, I would love to talk to you later. I was wondering if you've ever talked to midwifery students or um, would be interested in that. Mm -hmm. um, I have I have done midwifery at UCSF, actually. I've done those students there and I've done the pediatric residents at UCSF. So that's yay. really interesting to train them and to like get them to realize formula is not the only option when babies are losing weight or, or whatever the issue is. So yes, oh. I would love to do education with me with free. That's beautiful. Very cool. Right. It's good for us to know all our wonderful community resources and Ms. Brandy is definitely one of them. Yes, please. Um, like I said, feel free to send your clients our way. Have them follow our Instagram because we often do like breast pump giveaways. They'll find out where in our, you know, classes or our groups are. Because a lot of times there when mamas get that support in community, like see other women who are breastfeeding, other birthdays that are breastfeeding, they're like, I could do this. Like Last group, we just had two moms who were, one was going back to work and one was going back to school and their babies were around the same age. So they were asking like, okay, well, how do I pump? How do I do this? Okay, I got this much milk stored. You know, is this enough? So they were like bouncing ideas off each other and supporting each other, which is nice. And they 
kind of had the same feelings about leaving their four month old. They weren't ready yet, but you know, you gotta do what you gotta do because we in America. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was it was great for you know, just to see that sense of community and mama definitely. supporting each other. Definitely, definitely. So thank you again. You're welcome. And uh thank all of y'all for being here and for staying a little past time. Um, thank you for sharing this beautiful moment with me. 10 years of talking about feeding human milk to beautiful human babies. Um, anybody wants to help me plan next year's event, please talk to me now because we have learned that we need to plan way in advance. If, especially if we're going to be outside, it would, would be nice to have an event where we're all together in the same place. Although it's amazing how I can pull people from like all over the world on the internet. But I do miss our picnics and I do miss sitting outside. And today was just a beautiful day when I got woke up and the sun was already shining at seven o'clock. I was like, dang, how often does that happen in the Bay Area? And I've got to be working inside. So I did have some feelings. Uh, Marley, I, do you want to say any closing words? I'm just really grateful to be here. This is my first time attending such wonderful speakers, wonderful stories told. So just thank you. I appreciate that you've been holding this down for 10 years. That's amazing that you've created this space and held this space for 10 years. So thank you so much. And I just look forward to partnering with you next year. And hopefully we can be in person. Yes. And the connections made here, they've sparked so much within me. And I'm glad to bring all of this back to Sister Web. And just thank you for everything that you do and all the people feeding the babies. Just thank you for continuing. Feed them babies, on. people. Yes. Thank you. And uh, so I hope that Everybody got some new information today. Everybody saw a point of activism that we can start to work on. Um, I pride myself on training activist doulas. So while we do sit and we do complain, then, then we take action. So I wish you love and light in all of your lives and all the children in your lives, whether you've had them or you just love them, they're your nieces, nephews, uh, may they be surrounded with safety and care and love and empathy and um, happy 10 years to the Oakland Breastfeeding Festival goodbye everyone Mama said, sorry, I forgot to mention we're having a barbecue, a breastfeeding barbecue on Friday, August 30th. Oh, that is good. at John Sweeney Park in Alameda. Anybody wants to come in with us. Thank you for popping back on for that. Send me something and I'll send it around on, on, on the internet. You know, it's so funny, Brandy, but years ago when I was running a doula program for Alameda County um, with for teen moms, we had a yearly event called the Mama Q. <laughs> and so we had a we had a barbecue in my backyard and all the mamas would bring their babies and the pregnant mamas would be there and they would talk about their experiences. So that I'm I, I love that that's that kind of thing is still going on out there. That's great. Yep. Okay. Well, hopefully I'll see you on Friday. Yeah, on Wednesday. Yep. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye.